Number three, Scott Ruffalo. In December 2008, Scott Ruffalo was 39 years old. He was a successful and well-known hairstylist in Beverly Hills, California. Some of his clients include Benicio Del Toro, Sean Penn, members of En Vogue, and princes and princesses from several Middle Eastern countries. Scott was also known to help those in need. For example, he would give free haircuts to struggling actors who had important auditions. He would also style wigs for cancer survivors free of charge. Scott was married, but in December 2008, he was living alone in an apartment in Beverly Hills. His older brother, Mark Ruffalo, is an actor, and by the winter of 2008, Mark had starred in several major motion pictures like Zodiac, 13 Going on 30, and Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Around 1.10 a.m. on December 1st, 2008, a man called 911 and told them to go to Scott's apartment. The police and paramedics went to the apartment and they found Scott alone in his apartment. He was sitting on a chair, a gun was in his left hand, and he was bleeding from a gunshot wound in his forehead. He was alive and he was rushed to the hospital. He survived for a week in a coma. Then on December 8th, he was taken off life support and he passed away not long afterward. The police reviewed the surveillance footage from Scott's apartment building and they saw a man and a woman leaving the building a few minutes before the police and the paramedics arrived. They learned that the woman was 26-year-old Shaha Mishal Adam and the man was Christian Moradis. Adam was a client and a friend of Scott's. She was the daughter of a wealthy Saudi businessman who had close ties to the Saudi royal family. Adam was also a member of the Beverly Hills social elite. Some of her friends include Paris Hilton and Nicole Ritchie. Adam was the black sheep of her family because she liked to party and she was known to do drugs. Christian Moradis was also a friend of Scott's. Adam and Moradis supposedly didn't know each other and they met for the first time that night in Scott's apartment. Besides Adam and Moradis, the police also wanted to talk to a man named Brian Schofield. Schofield was Adam's boyfriend, and he wasn't in the apartment on the night that Scott was shot, but he was the person who called 911. Before Scott died, the police put out a warrant for attempted murder for both Adam and Schofield. On the same day that Scott died, Adam and Schofield turned themselves in. Adam's lawyer spoke to the press about what she was doing in Scott's apartment on the night that he was shot. He said that Adam was picking up the keys to her Range Rover, which she had let Scott borrow. Scott had given Moradis the Range Rover to get it detailed. But for some reason, while the Range Rover was in Moradis' possession, it had been impounded. What happened in Scott's apartment when both Baradis and Adam were there is unclear. Adam's lawyer said that Scott was high on cocaine. Just before Scott was shot, he was sitting in a chair. Adam's lawyer said that Adam turned away and she heard Scott say something about Russian roulette. Then she heard a gunshot. She turned around and found Scott bleeding from a gunshot wound in his head. She panicked and she called her boyfriend, Brian Schofield. Schofield then called 911. After Adam called Schofield, she left the scene, which her lawyer said was stupid of her to do. Adam's lawyer said that Scott was known to do cocaine and he had played with guns in front of other people. 
However, when Ad Ham's lawyer was asked who had seen Scott play with guns, he refused to identify any of these people or give any details about them. The police interviewed Moradis, who was in the apartment when Scott was shot. But what he told the police has never been made public. Schofield also talked to the police, and like Moradis, what he said isn't publicly known. After interviewing Moradis at him and Schofield, the police announced that Scott was killed during a game of Russian roulette. Moradis at him and Schofield were all released from custody, and none of them were charged with any crime. But then the medical examiner released their report, and they said that Scott's wound was not consistent with a game of Russian roulette. Notably, Scott was shot from a 45 degree angle from above and in front of his head. The gun was found in Scott's left hand and the bullet went into his hairline on the right side of his forehead. This all suggests that someone stood in front of him and fired down into his head as he was sitting in the chair. Also, there was no gunshot residue or gunpowder burns around the gunshot wound. Gunshot residue and powder burns are commonly found around the wound when someone is shot at close range. The medical examiner said that based on where Scott was shot, the angle in which the bullet entered his head, and the lack of gunshot residue and powder burns around the wound suggests that he most likely did not shoot himself. Finally, the toxicology report showed that Scott had small traces of cocaine, morphine, and alcohol in his system. The medical examiner said that the traces were so small that Scott was probably not intoxicated when he was shot. Because of the medical examiner's findings, the police ruled Scott's death a homicide. One interesting thing that the police found was two sets of fingerprints on the gun. One set was Scott's. The other set of fingerprints was Adham's. Adham's lawyer said that Adham had touched the gun earlier in the evening. Scott supposedly had the gun laying out and Adham said she moved it away from them for safety reasons. Despite the facts that Scott Ruffalo's death was ruled a homicide and Adham admitted to being in the apartment when he was shot and her fingerprints were found on the gun, she was never charged in connection with Scott's death. Then, on January 6, 2012, just over three years after Scott's death, Shaha Michelle Adham was admitted into the hospital. She died shortly afterward. She was 29 years old. The cause of death is suspected to be a drug overdose. The murder of Scott Ruffalo remains officially unsolved. In 2013, Mark Ruffalo did an interview with Men's Journal where he discussed the loss of his brother. He said he tried to get information from the police, but they were never very open with him regarding the investigation. Mark said that after the loss of his brother, he started to take more roles that reminded him of Scott. Specifically, he thought that the character Paul in the movie The Kids Are Alright was very similar to Scott. Mark was nominated for an Academy Award for his performance in the movie. Mark said he thinks about his brother every day. When talking about the loss of a murdered loved one, he said, You never get over it, you just get used to it. You get callous, a little bit harder maybe, so be on guard for that. But take these tragic things and turn them into something meaningful and worthy of the loss. Make it count. Number 2. Betty Gail Brown Harry Dean Stan was a character actor who had supporting roles in some of the most famous and beloved movies ever made, including The Godfather Part 2, Alien, and Cool Hand Luke. He also had a prolific TV acting career. 
He appeared in such classics as Gunsmoke, The Untouchables, and Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. He also had a small role in 2012's The Avengers. In the movie, he only had one scene, and he shared it with Mark Ruffalo. Some people have called Staten the greatest character actor of all time. By the autumn of 1961, Stan had appeared in nine movies, and he had three times as many TV roles. In that same autumn, Stan's niece, Betty Gail Brown, was 19 years old, and she was in her second year at Transylvania College in Lexington, Kentucky. She was majoring in French. Betty's mother, Quincy Stan Brown, was Harry Dean Stan's half-sister. While she was attending college, Betty, who was an only child, was living at home with her parents, who adored her. In fact, most people who knew Betty had a high opinion of her. In high school, she had been an honor student. In college, she continued to get good grades, and she was a member of a popular sorority. She volunteered at her church by teaching Sunday school and she sang in the choir. Betty was also popular with boys. She had dated several young men, but she never had a steady boyfriend. Even though Betty frequently dated, her friends and family were sure that she was waiting for marriage to have sex. October 26, 1961 was a fairly typical Thursday for Betty. The only thing that was unusual that day was that Betty drove her father's car to school and her father took her car to the mechanic because there had been a problem with the heater. Betty attended several classes that day and then she returned home for dinner. After dinner, her parents left the house at about 7 p.m. to go to a nearby drive-in movie theater. About 15 minutes later, Betty left the house and drove to the college campus in her car, a 1959 Gray Simca. The next day, Betty had a biology exam, and she expected that the exam was going to be difficult. She met up with three friends at a dormitory on campus, and they went to a study hall in the dormitory to study for the exam. At 11.55 p.m., she left the dormitory and walked to her car, which was in a parking lot across the road from the dormitory. One of Betty's friends, who was also parked in the parking lot, saw her getting into her car, and they chatted for a few minutes. He then got into his car and drove out of the parking lot. In her own car, Betty followed him out of the parking lot and then turned in the opposite direction of the way he was going. He said that Betty was heading in the direction of her home. The drive should have taken Betty 15 minutes. Betty's parents had returned home from the movie at about 10.30. Betty's mother, Quincy, never went to sleep until she knew that Betty was home. As it got to be midnight, Quincy started to worry but she knew that the dormitory closed to visitors at midnight, so she thought that Betty should be home around 12.15. At 12.40, Betty Stillheim returned home, and the panic inside of Quincy started to swirl. Quincy got in her car and drove towards the campus, looking for Betty's car. She made it all the way to the dormitory and didn't see Betty's car. Quincy then drove back home, hoping that her daughter had just driven past her and she didn't notice, or she had taken a different route home. Quincy was crushed when she got home and discovered that Betty still hadn't made it there. Quincy drove back to the college, but this time, she took a different route. Once again, she didn't see Betty's car as she drove. Quincy got to the college and drove around the campus, looking for Betty. Seeing no trace of her, Quincy drove home and woke up her husband and Betty's father, Hargis. 
Hargis called the police and he found out that night there were no car accidents involving a 1959 Simca. He gave the police a description of Betty and her car and told them that she was missing. At 2.30 a.m., the police made a broadcast to all their units, telling them to keep an eye out for a young woman matching Betty's description in a 1959 Simca that was gray in color. After talking to the police, Hargis went out looking for Betty. He searched for about 15 minutes and then he returned home. Then Quincy got back into the car and drove to the campus again. Around the same time that Quincy left her home for a third time, an officer was driving around the campus and he found a gray 1959 Simca parked in front of a building on campus. The car was parked about 300 yards from the dormitory where Betty had spent the night studying. In the driver's seat, he found the dead body of 19-year-old Betty Gail Brown. She was sitting upright and her bra was wrapped around her neck. There was also a cut on her forehead. He radioed in that he found the body and he taped off the crime scene. Shortly afterward, other officers arrived on the scene. One officer started searching the campus with a spotlight. When Quincy got to the campus, she parked her car near the dormitory where Betty had spent the evening studying. Then she saw the officer with a spotlight. She ran over to him and asked if he was looking for Betty. He had to tell her the heartbreaking news. They had found her only child murdered in her car. The police and the medical examiner pieced together how Betty was killed. They said that the killer hit Betty's head into the dashboard and this is what caused the cut on her forehead. Strangulation was the cause of death. She had been strangled with her bra which had rips and tears in it. What the police had a bigger problem with was the motive. When Betty's body was found, besides her bra, she was wearing all her clothes. The top two buttons of her blouse were undone, and besides that in her bra, her clothes were completely undisturbed. So the police didn't think that the murder was a sex crime. At first, the police thought that the bra had been torn off Betty because there were rips and tears in it. But then they learned from Betty's friends that she didn't like to wear her bra when she was menstruating, which she was at the time of her death. So she may have taken the bra off herself once she got into the car. The police found her purse in the car, so they ruled out robbery as a motive. Another problem that the police had with investigating the motive was that Betty was incredibly well liked. None of her friends or family had any idea who would want to hurt her. One question the police couldn't answer is how did the killer get into the car? According to the last person to see Betty alive, she drove away from the campus alone. She was a 15 minute drive from home and it was after midnight when she left the campus. Betty was petite. She was just under five feet tall and she weighed about 90 pounds. So it's unlikely she would have picked up a hitchhiker who was a stranger to her. Also, if Betty did have some type of enemy or she knew that someone didn't like her, she probably wouldn't have picked them up either. This suggests that if she did pick up her killer, she probably knew him or her and she was comfortable with them. Another question the police couldn't answer was if Betty was seen driving in the direction of her home then how did she end up back at the campus? It's doubtful that Betty would have picked up a hitchhiker and backtracked to the school. Also, Betty's dead body was found sitting upright in the driver's seat with a bra wrapped around her neck. This suggests she was killed in the driver's seat, 
probably where her car was parked. It isn't very likely that someone killed her, moved her body, drove to campus, and then put her body back in the driver's seat. The murderer probably would have just left Betty, where he or she killed her, and then fled from the car. Another possibility is that the killer somehow got into the car and he forced Betty to drive to the college campus. But why would the killer make her drive to the college campus? Why not make her drive to an isolated area where there would have been little chance that someone would have seen them? One possible explanation is that Betty didn't pick up her killer. Instead, the killer could have been hiding in the back seat and they just waited for Betty to get into the car. Betty was always careful to lock the doors of her car, but the lock on the front passenger door was faulty. So it's possible that someone could have gotten into her car while she was in the dormitory. Then, possibly moments after she pulled out of the parking lot, her killer surprised her forced her to drive to the spot where her car was found, and then strangled her there. The first suspect was Betty's friend, who talked to her in the parking lot outside the dormitory. He told the police that after he drove out of the parking lot, he went to his own dormitory. The police were able to confirm his alibi. Several people saw him and talked to him, in the dormitory after he arrived and in the hours afterward. The police made him take a polygraph exam. He said that he didn't kill Betty and he didn't know who did. The polygraph examiner concluded that he was telling the truth. So he was cleared as a suspect. The police then interviewed every male that Betty mentioned in her diary. They were all cleared as suspects as well. The police found three fingerprints in the car that didn't belong to Betty. The police started mass fingerprinting of all the male students at the college. After a few days they had fingerprinted half the male student body. But then they realized that they should compare the three unknown fingerprints to the fingerprints of Betty's parents. It turned out that one fingerprint belonged to Quincy, and another one belonged to Hargis. Then the mechanic who worked on Betty's car on the day she was killed came forward and said that the third fingerprint might be his. His fingerprints were compared to the third and last unknown fingerprint, and it was a match. The police continued to conduct interviews with people who were on campus on the night of the murder but it didn't turn up any leads. It wasn't long before the case became cold. Then, just over three years later, in January 1965, a 33-year-old alcoholic drifter named Alex Arnold Jr. was arrested in Klamath Falls, Oregon for being drunk and disorderly in public. He was fined $25, but he didn't have any money so he was sentenced to 10 days in jail. By his third day in jail, he was deep into alcohol withdrawal and he was hallucinating. He had threatened to kill himself, so he was placed in a special room and he was put on suicide watch. Not long after he was placed in the room, he told one of the jail staff members that he wanted to talk to a detective. The next morning, a detective came to talk to him. When the detective arrived, Arnold asked him to move him to a different room so they could talk. Arnold said that he wanted to talk in a different room because outside of the room that he was currently in, there was a mind reading machine. So the detective took him to a different room. Arnold then explained that he thought he had killed a woman in Lexington three or four years earlier. He said her name was Betty Gale Brown. He said it felt like a dream, but he was 99% sure he did it. After talking to Arnold, 
the detective called the police in Lexington. It turned out that one of the detectives who worked on Betty's case knew Arnold. Arnold was born and raised in Lexington, and the detective lived in the same neighborhood as him when they were both children. They even had a little contact while they were adults. The detectives who were assigned to Betty's case looked into Arnold's background and learned at the time of the murder he was living in Lexington. In fact, he lived a block and a half away from the campus. Two detectives traveled to Klamath Falls to interview Arnold. They read him his rights and they asked him if he wanted a lawyer. He said he understood his rights and he didn't want a lawyer, but he did want to confess to killing Betty. He explained that he was drunk and he was on the campus. He said he came across Betty and another woman making love in Betty's car. He asked them for a match for a cigarette and they got mad at him and started yelling at him. He got mad at them and he yanked the driver's door open. He grabbed Betty's head and slammed it into the dashboard and this knocked her out. The other woman got out of the car and ran away. Arnold said that he got worried that Betty would tell the police that he assaulted her, so he picked up her bra from the back seat and he strangled her. He then threw the bra on the front passenger seat. He then locked all the car doors by pressing down on the buttons on each door. He said after he killed Betty, he went to a friend's home. He said he told his friend that he had murdered a young woman. After he confessed to his friend, he drank some more, and then he passed out. The detectives from Lexington interviewed Arnold three times, and each time he confessed to the murder of Betty. At the end of the third interview, he signed the confession. Several days after he confessed, Arnold was charged with the murder of Betty Gale Brown, and he was flown back to Lexington. Before Arnold went to trial, Betty's mother, Quincy, supposedly visited Arnold in jail and told him that she didn't think that he killed her daughter. Quincy and Hargis then got a message to Arnold's lawyers. They wanted his lawyers to know that they didn't think that he killed Betty. Arnold went to trial in October 1965. The only piece of evidence against Arnold was his confession, and it was read aloud in court. Arnold's lawyers argued that it was a false confession. They claimed he was in the throes of alcohol withdrawal, and he wasn't in his right mind when he confessed. Notably, all the details about the murder in his confession can be found in the newspaper stories about the murder. Arnold's lawyers had him testify in his own defense. Arnold explained that a few months after Betty's murder, he had been arrested for pandering. While he was in jail, he had a cellmate who was questioned by the police about Betty's murder. Arnold said that his cellmate knew a lot of details about the murder after he talked to the police, and he talked about the murder with him. Arnold said that after that, he started having dreams about killing Betty, and this led him to think that he really was the killer. Arnold's lawyers then pointed out that a lot of details in Arnold's confession were incorrect. For example, he said he pressed down buttons to lock the car doors. But Betty's car didn't have button locks. The only way to lock the doors was to use the handles. Arnold claimed that after he killed Betty, he threw her bra on the front seat. But her bra was found wrapped around her throat. Also, Arnold said he happened upon Betty when she was making love with another woman in her car. However, there was no evidence that anyone other than Betty was in the car. If another woman was in the car, 
that she fled because Betty was being attacked, she could have very easily left something behind. Another problem is that Arnold said he happened upon Betty and her lover while they were in the driveway of a building on campus. If Betty was having a secret love affair with a woman, why would they park in a place so public? Why not go to some place more isolated? One major problem that the defense team had was that when Arnold was cross-examined, he once again admitted to killing Betty. Undeterred that their client, while under oath, admitted to the murder, Arnold's lawyers continued to try to prove that his confession was false. In his confession, Arnold said that after he killed Betty, he went to his friend's home. He supposedly told her that he had murdered a young woman, and then he went to sleep. The defense had his friend testify. She said that Arnold did not come to her home that night, and he never admitted to her that he killed Betty. Then the defense had Arnold's aunt testify. She said that Arnold was at her house on the night of the murder. The prosecution argued that there was no way that Arnold's aunt could specifically remember a random Thursday night in October, four years earlier. But she clearly remembered that night for several reasons. One reason that she remembered it was because Betty was murdered and her body was found in the early morning hours of October 27th. October 27th was her eldest son's birthday. Arnold's aunt said she remembered the evening of the 26th because her husband was drinking at a restaurant where Arnold worked. Her husband had been thrown out of the restaurant because he had caused some trouble and Arnold, who was working that night, brought him home. Her husband had brain disease and he was not well. She had to take her children to get inoculations the next morning and she didn't want her husband home alone while she was at the doctor's. So she asked Arnold to sleep over and stay with her husband the next morning until she got home. Arnold agreed and he spent the night. He left the next morning after she got home. After he left, she remembered reading about Betty's murder in the newspaper. So she knew, without a doubt, that Arnold was at her home when Betty was killed. As further evidence that she remembered that specific night, she said that her husband was sick for three days after he got kicked out of the restaurant. He was so sick that on the third day, she admitted him into the hospital. The defense entered into evidence records that showed that her kids did get inoculations on the same morning that Betty's body was found and other records that show that her husband was admitted to the hospital three days after the murder. The final witnesses for the defense were Betty's parents, Hargis and Quincy. They both said that they didn't believe that Betty was in the car with another woman that night. Both said that Betty dated several young men and they never saw any signs that she was attracted to women. Notably, Quincy said that even in her personal diary, Betty never mentioned being attracted to women and she only talked about liking men. The jury deliberated for six hours. Then they returned to court and they told the judge that they were hopelessly deadlocked. Seven jurors had voted to acquit and five had voted to convict. The judge declared a mistrial and ordered Arnold to stand trial again in January 1966. After the mistrial was declared, Arnold's lawyers got his bail reduced and he was released from jail. He did not end up going to trial in January 1966 because the trial was postponed. The trial was supposed to take place later that year, but it was never rescheduled. Nearly seven years later, the charges were officially dismissed, and Alex Arnold Jr. never went to trial again for the murder of Betty Gale Brown. After he was released from jail, 
Arnold continued to drink. He eventually developed diseases of the liver. He died in 1980 at the age of 49. No one else has ever been charged with Betty Gail Brown's murder. Her case is considered cold, and because the police could not determine a clear motive, and there was very little physical evidence, there is a good chance that the case will never be solved. Number 1. Marina Hobb Janos Bukowski was born in Budapest, Austria, Hungary in February 1911, and he grew up in Vienna. In 1930, he adopted the name Hans Hobb, and he also left university to pursue a career in journalism. In 1932, he first got international recognition because he wrote a report identifying Adolf Hitler's real last name, which was Schickelgruber. When World War II broke out, Hans joined the French Army. He was captured in June 1940, but he managed to escape. After he escaped, he made his way to the United States. In 1941, he published a book about his experiences in the war, titled, A Thousand Shall Fall. It was translated into 18 languages, and it became a bestseller, with over 6 million copies sold. In 1943, MGM made the book into a movie called The Cross of Lorraine, and it stars Jean-Pierre Amand and Gene Kelly. After Hans published the book, he joined the U.S. Army as a private. He went on to serve in Africa, Italy, Luxembourg, and Germany. He eventually rose to the rank of Major, and he was awarded the Bronze Star, among other medals. At the end of the war, the United States established 18 newspapers in Germany. Hans was made editor-in-chief of all 18. After a few years in Germany, he moved back to the United States, where he continued to write books, several of which were bestsellers. In 1948, he got married to Eloise Hart, who was an American actress. It was Hans' fifth marriage. By the time they got married, Eloise had been in a dozen movies, mostly in uncredited roles. On February 23, 1951, Eloise gave birth to a daughter named Marina. After the birth of Marina, Eloise and Hans' marriage lasted for another seven years. During that time, Hans wrote several books and a few of them were adapted into films. Eloise continued to get small roles in movies and TV shows. Hans eventually settled in Escana, Switzerland, while Eloise continued to live with Marina in Los Angeles. In September 1968, Marina, who was 17 years old, started school at the University of Hawaii in Honolulu. But during that first semester, she decided she wouldn't be returning after Christmas break. She had a boyfriend, Joe Hornberg, and he had been in the army, but he was nearing the end of his service. Marina planned to enroll at a university in California so she'd be closer to Hornberg. On December 29, 1968, Marina was in Los Angeles. On that night, she went out with Hornberg and two other couples to a nightclub on Sunset Strip. Afterward, Marina and Hornberg went back to Hornberg's parents' home. Marina changed out of her evening dress into more casual clothes. At 3.15 a.m., Marina left the Hornberg's home and drove home in her red sports car. Fifteen minutes later, Marina's mother Eloise, who was at home in bed, was awoken by the sound of a car with a loud muffler. She looked out of her bedroom window and saw Marina's car parked in the driveway and there was a black sedan beside it. A man was standing beside Marina's car. 
He said something to the effect of, let's go. Then the black sedan backed out of the driveway and onto the road. The man ran to the car and got in on the passenger side. Then the car sped away. Eloise got an odd feeling, so she went to check to see if Marina was home. Much to her dismay, Marina was not in the house. So she called the police. The police looked at Marina's car and they saw that the emergency brake had been pulled hard. They did not think that Marina would have had enough strength to pull it back that far by herself. Two days later, a man walking his dog found Marina's body. It had been dumped in some brush at the bottom of a slope off Mulholland Drive about seven miles from where she had been kidnapped. She had been stabbed in the chest, the back, and the neck at least half a dozen times. She had also been beaten in the head with a blunt object. The cause of death was blood loss. The medical examiner said that based on where the wounds were located, it indicated that she was probably stabbed by more than one person. She had probably been killed within 24 hours of her body being found. She was fully dressed and there were no signs of sexual assault. Her purse had been found in the same area two hours before her body was found. So the police don't think that the motive was sexual assault or robbery. The police couldn't find anyone who wanted to hurt Marina so they were at a complete loss as to who killed her and why they killed her. Unfortunately, Marina's murder wasn't the only murder connected to Mulholland Drive in the late 1960s and early 1970s. On May 19, 1969, five months after Marina's murder, the body of 18-year-old Rose Tashman was found in a ravine off Mulholland Drive. Her body was found about half a mile away from where Marina's body had been dumped. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death with a wire. The night before her body was found, Tashman had gone to study with a friend and she didn't return home. The day after her body was found, her car was found with a flat tire a few miles away from where her body was dumped. It suspected that her killer saw that she had a flat tire and offered her a ride. He then sexually assaulted her, strangled her, and dumped her body. Then, six months later, on November 16, 1969, a 15-year-old boy was birdwatching in the same area where Marina Hobbs' body was found 11 months earlier. He found the body of a young woman who had been stabbed 157 times in the neck and the torso. She was fully clothed and there were no signs of sexual assault. For decades, she was unidentified and she was given the nickname Sherry Doe. She was finally identified in 2015, 46 years after she was killed. A woman came across Sherry Doe's photo on the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System website and she thought that Sherry Doe looked like the missing sister of one of her friends, Ann Jurvidson. The friend showed Ann the photo and she saw similarities to her missing sister, Reet. Reet was born in Sweden, but she grew up in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. In the summer of 1969, Ree was 18 years old, and she was working in Toronto, Ontario. While living there, she became smitten with a man only known as John, which was possibly spelled J-E-A-N. John moved to Los Angeles, and late in the summer of 1969, Ree traveled there to be with him. Several months after Ree arrived in Los Angeles, she was found stabbed to death. A year after Reed was murdered, in the early morning hours of November 15, 1970, 18-year-old Robin Graham was driving home after a night of partying. 
She drove on to the Hollywood Freeway, but after a minute of driving, she ran out of gas. She pulled off onto the shoulder of the freeway near the Santa Monica Boulevard off-ramp. An officer with the California Highway Patrol stopped and asked her if she wanted him to call a tow truck for her. She declined the offer and walked to a call box and phoned home. She then walked back to her car. The same officer talked to her and she said she had gotten a hold of her parents and they were going to pick her up. Shortly afterward, the officer drove past her a third time. Near her car, he saw her talking to a man in his mid-twenties. Parked nearby was a 1957 to 1960 prime light blue Corvette hardtop. The officer assumed that the young man was there to pick her up. Unfortunately, Graham never made it home and she was reported missing. She has never been found dead or alive. The murders of Marina Hobb, Rose Tashman, and Reed Jervison, and the disappearance of Robin Graham are all unsolved. Because the victims were so similar in age and appearance, and because of the area where their bodies were found or where they went missing, there is speculation that at least a few of them are connected. The cases even have some high profile suspects. The suspects first emerged in November 1969. A month earlier, a woman named Susan Atkins had been arrested for car theft. In November, while she was in jail, she bragged that she and a group of friends had committed two notorious home invasions several months earlier. In early December 1969, Atkins made a deal with prosecutors where she would tell them everything. She explained that in the summer of 1967, she was 20 years old and she was in the Haight-Ashbury district of San Francisco. It was there that she met a man named Charles Manson. Manson had developed a following of young women and Atkins joined them. By this time, Manson had four other followers. In the autumn of that year, they all moved to Los Angeles. In May 1968, some of the young women that were associated with Manson were hitchhiking and Dennis Wilson from the Beach Boys picked them up. Not long afterward, Manson and his followers moved in to Wilson's home. They lived there for several months before they moved to a ranch that was owned by an elderly man named George Spawn. By the summer of 1968, Manson had about a dozen followers. In late 1968, Manson started talking about a race war that he thought was looming called Helter Skelter. Manson told his followers that during the war, black people would wipe out all the white people. Fearing Helter Skelter would happen soon, in the early part of 1969, Manson and his family started to prepare for it. Manson was also getting more and more frustrated because he had tried to break into the music business, but he had failed. The Beach Boys recorded a song he wrote, but he had failed to get himself a record deal. In June 1969, one of Manson's followers, Charles Watson, who went by the nickname Tax, ripped off a drug dealer named Bernard Crow. Crow was angry and threatened to kill everyone at Spawn Ranch. So on July 1st, Manson and one of his followers, Thomas Wallman, went to Crow's apartment. Manson shot Crow in the chest with a 22 caliber handgun. Crow survived the shooting. Several weeks later, a Manson follower named Bobby Bosley was ripped off in a drug deal. He had given a 34-year-old biker named Gary Hinman a few thousand dollars, but Hinman didn't give him the drugs. So on July 25, 1969, Manson, Bosley, and Atkins 
along with other family members, Mary Bruner and Bruce Davis, went to Hinman's home. They demanded money, but Hinman said he didn't have any. The Manson cut the left side of Hinman's face with a sword. His ear was cut in half. Atkins and Bruner stitched up his ear with dental floss. After cutting Hinman, Manson and Davis left. Mostly Atkins and Bruner stayed in Hinman's home for the next two days. Then on the 27th, Bosley stabbed him in twice in the chest, but the stabs did not kill him. So Bosley held a pillow over his face for two minutes. Then he had Bruner hold the pillow over his face. After a few minutes, Agnes took over, pressing the pillow down on him in his face. After he was dead, Atkins wrote political piggy on the wall in Hinman's blood. Then Atkins, Bruner, Postley drove away in Hinman's car. About two weeks later, Postley was arrested while driving Hinman's car. The knife that was used in the murder, which was still covered in blood, was found in the wheel well. Three nights after Postley's arrest, on the night of August 8, 1969, Manson ordered Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, Linda Caspian, and Patricia Krenwinkle to go to 10,050 Cielo Drive. Manson ordered them to kill everyone who was at the house. A record producer named Terry Melcher used to live there. Manson was angry at Melcher because Melcher didn't get him a record deal. But Melcher no longer lived in the house. Instead, it was being rented by film director Roman Polanski and his wife, Sharon Tate, who was an actress. Manson knew that Melcher didn't live there anymore because months earlier, he had gone to the house looking for him and learned that Melcher had moved. Watson, Atkins, Caspi, and Krenwinkel drove over to the property and climbed over the gate. As they approached the main house, they saw some headlights on the driveway, and they realized a car was heading towards them. The car was being driven by 18-year-old Stephen Perrin. Perrin had been visiting the property's caretaker, who lived in the guest house. Watson forced Perrin to stop his car. Then Watson slashed Perrin with a knife and shot him four times. After Perrin was dead, Watson, Atkins, and Krenwinkel broke into the house while Caspian stayed outside to watch the gates. In the house, they found Sharon Tate, who was 26 years old and eight and a half months pregnant. Her husband, Roman Polanski, wasn't home. Instead, he was in London, England. Also there that night was Tate's friend and former boyfriend, 35-year-old Jay Sebring, 32-year-old Wojtek Frykowski, who was a friend of Polanski's, and Frykowski's 25-year-old girlfriend, Abigail Folger. Folger was the heiress to the Folger coffee fortune. They were all led to the living room. Watson started to tie Tate and Sebring together, but Sebring began to struggle, so Watson shot him and then stabbed him seven times. Frykowski managed to free himself from his binds, and he ran out to the front yard. Watson chased after him. When Watson caught up with him, he struck him in the head with his gun, stabbed him several times, and then shot him twice. Folger then managed to run away, and she made it to the pool area. Krenwinkel chased her, then tackled her and started stabbing her. Watson then came to the pool area and stabbed Folger to death. Watson then went back to Frykowski, who was still alive on the lawn. Watson stabbed him until he died. Then either Watson or Atkins, or both of them, stabbed Sharon Tate to death. Once all five victims were dead, 
Atkins wrote pig on the front door with Tate's blood. The housekeeper found the dead bodies the next morning. About 24 hours after the mass murder, the four people who committed the massacre went out cruising for more victims with Manson and two other family members, Steve Grogan and Leslie Van Houten. They sailed on the house located at 3301 Waverly Drive. Inside the home was 44-year-old supermarket executive Lino LeBianca and his 38-year-old wife, Rosemary. Manson and Watson got into the home through the back door. They tied up Lino and Rosemary. The Manson came out and sent Krenwinkel and Van Houten inside. Then Watson started stabbing Lino with a bayonet. In the bedroom, Rosemary tried to fight off Krenwinkel and Van Houten. This drew Watson into the bedroom, and he stabbed Rosemary several times with a bayonet. Watson then went back into the living room and continued to stab Lino. In the bedroom, Krenwinkel stabbed Rosemary with a knife that she had gone from the kitchen. When Watson came back into the bedroom, he ordered Van Houten to stab Rosemary. Manson had ordered Watson to make all the women take part in the murders. After the Labiancas were dead, Krenwinkel wrote Rise and Death the Pigs on the walls in blood. She also wrote Helter Skelter on the refrigerator in blood. At first, the police didn't think that the Tate murders and the La Bianca murders were connected. Less than a week after the La Bianca murders, Spawn Ranch was raided by the police. But it wasn't in regards to the murders. Instead, the police were looking for stolen dune buggies. Manson thought that a man named Donald Shea talked to the police, and this led to the raid. Shea was the foreman on Spawn Ranch, and he and Manson did not get along. Ten days after the raid, Manson, along with family members Tex Watson, Bruce Davis, Steve Grogan, Bill Vance, and Larry Bailey, asked Donald Shea to drive them to a distant area of the ranch. As Shea was driving, Grogan bashed him in the head with a pipe, and then Watson stabbed him. They pulled him out of the car and continued to beat and stab him. Then they buried his body. Afterward, they burned all his belongings. Then about a month and a half later, the police arrested Manson and 26 other people on Spawn Ranch for car theft. At the time, the police had no reason to suspect that Manson and his followers were responsible for the tate Labianca murders. Then a month after they were arrested, Susan Atkins started talking about the home invasions to her cellmates. Atkins agreed to work with the prosecution, and Manson and several other family members were charged with murder. Manson, Atkins, Van Houten, and Krenwinkel's trial began in July 1970 and it was a media circus. They were eventually all found guilty and they were sentenced to death. Tex Watson was convicted of seven counts of first degree murder in 1971 and he was also sentenced to death. Then in 1972, California abolished the death penalty and all their sentences were commuted to life in prison. No one in the Manson family ever confessed to the murders of Marina Hobb or the murders and disappearance of the other three young women, but they are considered suspects for several reasons. Marina was kidnapped on December 29, 1968. At the time of her murder, the Manson family was living on Spawn Ranch and it was right around the time that Manson started talking about Helter Skelter. Several aspects of Marina's murder were quite similar to the other Manson family murders. Notably, all the Manson murders were committed by groups of people. 
It is believed that at least two people were involved in Marina's kidnapping and murder. Marina's mother was sure she saw one man in her driveway and then he got into the passenger seat of a dark sedan, so at least one other person was in the car. Also, her stab wound seemed to indicate that more than one person stabbed her. Many victims of the Manson family have been stabbed multiple times by several people. Also, like the rest of the Manson family's victims, Marina had not been sexually assaulted. Another reason people suspect that the Manson family is responsible for Marina's slaying is because she fit their victim profile. Specifically, the Manson family targeted wealthy people. Marina was kidnapped after she arrived home in her sports car. Her killers could have spotted her as she was driving home or as she turned into her driveway and then they kidnapped her. So based on her car, they may believe she was wealthy, making her a viable target. The next victim was Rose Tashman, who was found strangled to death in May 1969. She was killed around the time that Manson's frustration about not getting a record deal was at its peak. What separates Tashman's murder apart from the other Manson family murders is that she was sexually assaulted. She was also strangled, while most of the Manson family's victims were stabbed, shot, and beaten. So it's unclear if her murder is connected to the Manson family. For many years before she was identified, the police thought that Reed Jervison could have been a victim of the Manson family. People remembered a young woman who matched Reed's description hanging around with the Manson family just before her body was found. They thought her name was Sherry, which is why Reed's body was referred to as Sherry Doe. A major element that tied Reed's murder to the Manson family was that her death was overkill. She had been stabbed 157 times. Sharon Tate had been stabbed 16 times, Abigail Folger had been stabbed 28 times, Wojtek Frykowski had been stabbed 51 times, Lino LeBianca had been stabbed 12 times, and Rosemary LeBianca had been stabbed 41 times. One major problem with the theory that Reed was a victim of the Manson family is that many of the family members were in jail when she was killed. But there were a few family members that were out of jail and it's believed that they even committed another murder around the time that Reed was killed. On November 5th, 1969, the police were called to a home in Venice Beach where some of the family members were living. One of the family members, 22-year-old John Philip Hodge, had been shot in the head. When the paramedics arrived, Hot was already dead. The other Manson family members who were in the home that night were Bruce Davis, Madeline Joan Cottage, Sue Bartell, and Catherine Gillies. They said that Hot had been playing Russian roulette and he shot himself. But there were some oddities with the scene. For example, the gun that Hot had been playing Russian roulette with was fully loaded. Also, the gun and the case which held the gun had no fingerprints on them. Sometime later, a man approached a writer with the Los Angeles Times. The man would not reveal his identity, but he said that one of the women shot hot. He didn't stick around to talk to the authorities and his identity is still unknown. Vincent Boliosi was the lead prosecutor on the Manson case. After the trial, he wrote what is considered the definitive book on the case, Helter Skelter. In the book, he speculates that Reed witnessed Hot's murder and she was killed as a way to silence her. However, all of this speculation was made before Reed was identified. After she was identified in 2015, the police thought that Reed might not have actually been a victim of the Manson family. 
They now think that she was most likely killed by her mysterious boyfriend, John. Notably, John never reported her missing, and he didn't come forward after her body was found. In July 2016, the police interviewed someone who said he met Reed at a cafe in Montreal before she moved to California and she was with two men. The witness thought that both men's names were John. She said that one of the men was Reed's boyfriend. He was described as at least 5 feet 9 inches in height with brown eyes and long brown hair that was feathered. He apparently resembled Jim Morrison, the lead singer of The Doors. His friend was about 5'6 with blue eyes and he had dark hair that was described as being styled like one of the Beatles. Also, he had a French accent. Both descriptions were what the men might have looked like in the late 1960s. It's possible that the two men were roommates. The police also learned where Reed was living before she was killed. It was a four-story building called the Paramount Hotel and it was near Paramount Studios in Hollywood. Reed lived in apartment 306. The police are hoping that people who were living in the building in the summer and fall of 1969 will come forward with information about Reed or either man possibly named John. Finally, there is the disappearance of Robin Graham. Since Graham's body has never been found, there has been rampant speculation about what happened to her. After she went missing, the Los Angeles Times did a story about her disappearance. After the story was published, Graham's parents received an odd letter in the mail. The author wrote that her car had stalled on the side of the road. A man driving a Corvette stopped near her car. He said he was an off-duty police officer and he offered her a ride. She got a weird feeling about him, so she didn't accept the ride. She wrote that she was sure the man was Bruce Davis. Davis was a member of the Manson family. While many members of the Manson family were in jail when Graham went missing, Davis was not in jail and he was in hiding. He turned himself in about a month after Graham disappeared. Davis was later convicted of murdering Donald Shea and Gary Hinman, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Bruce Davis is also one of the many people considered a possible suspect in the Zodiac murders. The last confirmed Zodiac murder happened in October 1969, about 13 months before Graham went missing. Some people think that Graham was a victim of the Zodiac because she went missing on a night where there was a full moon. All the confirmed Zodiac victims were killed on nights with a new moon or a full moon. However, all of this is just speculation. Many people doubt Bruce Davis is the Zodiac and there is no evidence that he is connected to the disappearance of Robin Graham. One possibility is that one person, or a group of people, who are not associated with the Manson family are responsible for the three murders and the disappearance of Graham. For example, it could be Reed Jervison's boyfriend, John, and possibly his friend or roommate, who was also possibly named John. Another possibility is that none of the cases are connected and there are four different people, or groups of people, who are responsible for each crime. Unfortunately, the four cases have been cold for five decades and there is a good chance that they will never be solved. Number 3. Danny Lockin Joseph and Jean Lockin were married on Halloween in 1937 in Nashua, Iowa. Shortly after they were wed, they moved to Honolulu, Hawaii because Joseph had gotten a job running a pineapple plantation for Dole. Jean had been a professional dancer who had performed in New York City at the tail end of the vaudeville era. 
Jean gave birth to a son named Daniel on July 13, 1943. Daniel, who everyone called Danny, would be their only child. In 1946, the family moved to Plattsville, Nebraska before settling in Omaha, Nebraska. In Omaha, Jean opened a dance studio. From a young age, Danny danced, sang, and acted. He became a professional performer when he was just eight years old. Danny and another boy his age, Neil Reynolds, performed together under the name The Two Checkers. They performed comedy routines, did impressions, sang, and danced. The Two Checkers performed together for several years. In 1959, when Daniel was 16, his family moved to Anaheim, California to help further his entertainment career. After moving to Anaheim, Danny got some small, uncredited roles in movies like Gypsy starring Rosalind Russell and Natalie Wood and The Stripper starring Joanne Woodward. He also landed a small part in the TV show My Three Sons. Danny also auditioned for the role of Rolf in The Sound of Music. He was seriously considered, but he ultimately did not get the part. After Danny graduated from high school, he moved to New York City to try his hand at stage acting. He landed supporting roles in several plays, including Gypsy and The Sound of Music. In 1966, he was cast as Barnaby Tucker in Hello, Dolly. In 1968, the musical was made into a movie starring Barbara Streisand. Danny was cast in the role of Barnaby Tucker. After the movie was released in December 1969, Danny continued to portray the role of Barnaby on Broadway. He did this role for about a year. Danny's portrayal of Barnaby on both stage and screen was the peak of his career. When Danny was 28, he moved back to Anaheim where he taught dance at his mother's dance studio. The studio closed in early 1977, so Danny started teaching at another studio. On Friday, August 20th, 1977, Danny competed on NBC's The Gong Show. He and his partner did a song and dance routine. They ended up tying for first place. The next night, Saturday, August 21st, Danny went to a gay bar in Garden Grove, California. Danny had been married to a woman, but they divorced after two years. He was never really open about his sexuality, but it's believed he was bisexual. At the time, Danny lived with his mother. His father had passed away over 16 years earlier. Danny did not come home that night, but his mother wasn't worried because sometimes he stayed out all night. After all, he was a 34-year-old man. But when he didn't come home on Sunday night, she became worried and she called the police. It turned out that on Saturday night, Danny went to the apartment of 34-year-old Charles Hopkins. Hopkins had worked as a medical clerk, but at that time, he was unemployed. On that Sunday afternoon, Hopkins called the police and told them that there was a dead body in his apartment. The police arrived and they found the dead body of a man who had suffered nearly a hundred stab wounds. The body had also been mutilated after death. The man had no identification on him. Two days later, the body was identified as 34-year-old Daniel Lockin. The police discovered his identity after they ran his fingerprints through the system. Danny had previously been arrested for driving under the influence and that's when the police got his fingerprints. Charles Hopkins had an unusual explanation for what happened on the night Danny died. Hopkins admitted that Danny came back to his apartment after the bar. 
at the apartment. They had a drink together. Hopkins said he wasn't attracted to Danny and decided not to pursue any sexual relations. He said that Danny asked him for some money, but he didn't give him any. Danny then left the apartment. Hopkins said that after Danny left, he went to bed. He claimed he woke up a short time later and as he was walking out of his bedroom, he was hit on the head. Hopkins claimed he lost consciousness and woke up several hours later. When he regained consciousness, he found Danny's dead body in the bathroom. Hopkins said he moved the body into the living room and then cleaned up the washroom. Afterward, he cleaned up the living room. He then went swimming and got his clothes ready for the next day. It was only after he did all those activities that he called the police. Hopkins was asked how Danny ended up being stabbed a hundred times in his apartment. Hopkins said he wasn't sure, but he had two theories. He thought it was possible that Danny broke in and hit him on the head. Hopkins said that after he was hit on the head, his body might have gone into autopilot and he defended himself. But he doubted that theory himself. He said a more likely scenario was that Danny had an accomplice with him when he broke into his apartment and the accomplice killed Danny after he lost consciousness. The police searched Hopkins' apartment and they found a book. It was full of violent pornography that featured pictures of men being tortured. Charles Hopkins' trial started in May 1978 but it had to be delayed because his lawyer suffered a leg injury. His trial resumed in late July 1978. Hopkins was ultimately found guilty of voluntary manslaughter and he was sentenced to four years of prison. With good behavior, he would have only had to serve two years. After Charles Hopkins served his sentence, he stayed out of the public eye. He supposedly died in 2006 from natural causes. Number 2. Rebecca Schaefer Rebecca Schaefer was born in Eugene, Oregon in November 1967. Not long after she was born, her family moved to Portland, Oregon. Her father was a child psychologist and her mother was a writer and college instructor. When Rebecca was young, she wanted to be a rabbi when she grew up. But by the time she got into her teens, she found herself interested in a much different career, modeling. In 1984, when Schaefer was 17 years old, she moved to New York City alone to pursue her modeling career. In New York, she got work as an actress, appearing in the soap opera Guiding Light in a small, uncredited role. Schaefer struggled to get work as a model because she was only 5'7", and models are usually taller. But she continued to find acting work. In 1985, she had a small, ongoing role on the soap opera One Life to Live. She also got a small role in the movie Radio Days, which was written and directed by Woody Allen. While these roles were small, they did help her land one of the lead roles on the CBS sitcom, My Sister Sam. The show is about a woman named Sam, played by Pam Dauber, who lives in San Francisco, California, and works as a photographer. One day, her 16-year-old sister, Patty, which was Schaefer's role, shows up and lives with her. The show debuted in October 1986, and it was a moderate hit. One person who watched the show was 16-year-old Robert John Bardo, who lived in Tucson, Arizona. Bardo was the youngest of seven children, and he was considered a loner. Bardo's family was highly dysfunctional. Bardo later claimed that one of his brothers physically and emotionally abused him. When Bardo was 13, he became obsessed with Samantha Smith, a child peace activist. 
In November 1982, Samantha wrote to Yuri Andropov, the new leader of the Soviet Union. She congratulated him on being the leader and encouraged him to be peaceful with the United States. Andrew Paul was touched by Samantha's letter, so he wrote a letter back. In the letter, he invited Samantha to visit the Soviet Union. The correspondence between the 10-year-old American girl and the leader of the Soviet Union was big news in both countries. Samantha traveled to the Soviet Union in July 1983. Sadly, Samantha was killed in a plane crash in August 1985 when she was 13. When Bardo was 13 and became obsessed with Samantha, she was 11. He wrote a letter to her and she wrote back. 13-year-old Bardo ended up stealing money from his mother and getting on a bus to Maine to go look for Samantha. He was found by juvenile authorities before he could contact Samantha. After Bardo was in custody, he stabbed himself with a pen. Back at school, Bardo's teachers noted that he was a disturbed young man. He wrote letters to a teacher and sometimes he wrote multiple letters a day. The letters clearly show that Bardo was detached from reality. He often wrote about death. This included his own death from suicide and murdering the teacher. He would sign off the letters with the names of fictional characters like Dirty Harry Callahan and James Bond. His teachers told his parents he should get psychiatric help. Bardo went to counseling for about a week and then his parents put a stop to it. In the summer of 1985, when Bardo was 15, he was hospitalized because of his psychiatric problems. His parents pulled him out of the hospital after a month. That autumn, despite getting straight A's all the way through high school, Bardo dropped out of school. He then became a janitor at a fast food restaurant. By the time Robert John Bardo was 16, he had not had a girlfriend or even gone on a date. When he saw Rebecca Schaefer on My Sister Sam, he was immediately enamored with her because he thought she was pure and innocent. He ended up writing several letters to Schaefer. She responded to one and wrote that she appreciated his letter because it was nice and it seemed real. She signed off, Love, Rebecca. She also sent him an autograph photo. After receiving the letter and the photo, Bardo felt that he and Schaefer were connected. Bardo traveled to Los Angeles twice and went to the Warner Brothers studio lot where my sister Sam was being shot. Both times he was turned away by security and he returned to Tucson. My Sister Sam ended up being renewed for a second season. But due to low ratings, it was cancelled in April 1988, halfway through the second season. When the show went off the air, Bardo's obsession with Schaefer seemed to weaken. Instead, he became obsessed with pop singers Tiffany and Debbie Gibson. After My Sister Sam, Schaefer got a small role in the movie Scenes from the Class Struggle in Beverly Hills. It was released in July 1989. One person who saw the movie was 19-year-old Robert John Bardo. Bardo was mortified by Schaefer's role in the movie. She appeared in a love scene and this shattered the illusion that Bardo had about her that she was pure and innocent. He decided to kill Schaefer and he made plans to murder her. He also started sending her dark and threatening letters. Bardo also wrote letters to Mark David Chapman who was in prison for shooting John Lennon to death in December 1980. Chapman wrote two letters to Bardo, but then he stopped corresponding because he thought Bardo's letters were disturbing. Bardo also started researching a man named Arthur Jackson. 
Jackson had lived in Aberdeen, Scotland. He became obsessed with an actress named Teresa Saldana after seeing her in the movies Defiance and Raging Bull. Jackson came up with an elaborate plan on how to find out where Saldana lived. He hired a private investigator who found out Saldana's mother's phone number. Jackson then called Saldana's mother and he said he was the assistant to director Martin Scorsese and he asked for her daughter's address so he could send her a script. Saldana's mother unwillingly gave the address to Jackson. Jackson traveled from Aberdeen to Los Angeles. He attacked Saldana with a knife in front of her home. A delivery man stopped the attack. Saldana suffered 10 stab wounds. She spent four months in the hospital, but ultimately she survived. Jackson was sentenced to 12 years of prison for attempted murder. His sentence was later reduced to six years for good behavior. But then, just before Jackson was about to be paroled in 1990, it was revealed that while he was in prison, he sent threatening letters to Saldana and the delivery man who rescued her. For sending the threatening letters, Jackson was sentenced to another five years and eight months of prison. He was released from prison in 1996, but he was immediately extradited to England. It turned out that in 1967, Jackson had robbed a bank in Chelsea. During the robbery, he shot and killed 33-year-old Anthony Fletcher. In January 1997, Jackson pleaded guilty to manslaughter and he was sent to a psychiatric hospital. Arthur Jackson died in the psychiatric hospital in 2004 at the age of 68. Robert John Bardo was inspired by how Jackson figured out where Teresa Saldana lived. Bardo ended up paying a private detective $250 to find out Rebecca Schaefer's home address. He told the private detective that Schaefer was his long lost friend. On July 17, 1989, 19 year old Robert John Bardo traveled from Tucson to Los Angeles. The next morning, Bardo went to 21-year-old Rebecca Schaefer's apartment building. He pressed the buzzer to her apartment. Schaefer's intercom was broken, so she came downstairs. Later that same day, Schaefer was supposed to meet with director Francis Ford Coppola to read for a part in The Godfather Part 3. She was expecting a script that was supposed to be delivered that morning. Instead, when she got downstairs, she found Bardo, who was a stranger to her. Bardo told Schaefer he was her biggest fan. He also showed her the letter and the autographed picture she had sent him. Schaefer told Bardo to leave and not to come back to her home. They shook hands and Bardo walked away. He went to a diner where he had breakfast. Rebecca went back to her apartment and started getting ready for her meeting with Coppola. Bardo returned to Schaefer's apartment building at 10.15 a.m. Once again, he pressed her buzzer and Schaefer came downstairs. Then, 19-year-old Robert John Bardo shot 21-year-old Rebecca Schaefer point-blank in the chest with a 357 Magnum. Bardo watched Rebecca as she laid on the ground bleeding from the gunshot wound. Rebecca said, why, why? A neighbor who heard the gunshot came out of their apartment. They saw Rebecca on the ground and Bardo standing over her. Bardo then took off running. As he ran, he threw away a book he was carrying. It was Catcher in the Rye by J.D. Salinger. It was the same book that Mark David Chapman was carrying when he killed John Lennon. Shaver was rushed to the hospital. About half an hour after arriving at the hospital, Shaver was pronounced dead. After murdering the 21-year-old actress, 
Ardo took a bus back to Tucson. The next day, Bardo was arrested as he was wandering around an interstate in Tucson. It appeared that he was trying to get hit by a car. Once Bardo was in custody, he confessed to the murder of Rebecca Schaefer. Bardo went to trial in September 1991. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. His trial lasted for five weeks. He was found guilty of first degree murder. He was sentenced to life without the chance of parole. At the time of this video, Robert John Barno is incarcerated at the Avenal State Prison in Avenal, California. The murder of Rebecca Schaefer led to stricter stalking laws and privacy laws in California. Number 1. Judith Barcy In the mid-1970s, Maria Viravas was working as a waitress at a restaurant in Los Angeles, California. The restaurant was a popular hangout for people who had immigrated from Hungary. Maria herself had fled from Soviet-occupied Hungary. While working at the restaurant, she met a man named Joe Barcy. Joe had also fled from Hungary. In the United States, Joe worked as a plumbing contractor. Maria first took notice of Joe because he always paid with $100 bills. They started dating and eventually got married. Maria gave birth to a daughter, Judith, on June 6, 1978. From an early age, Maria wanted her daughter to work in the entertainment industry. When Judith was five years old, a crew was making a commercial at a local ice rink and they saw her skating. Something about Judith caught the attention of the crew and she was hired to work on the commercial. It was the first of 72 commercials she would appear in. She also got acting roles in television productions. Her first television role was in the NBC miniseries, Fatal Vision, which was broadcast in November 1984. Fatal Vision is based on the controversial true crime book of the same name. Fatal Vision details the complex Jeffrey McDonald murder case. McDonald, who was an army captain and physician, was convicted in August 1979 of the February 1970 murders of his pregnant wife and two young daughters. McDonald has always said he is innocent and he says that a group of hippies committed the murders. In Fatal Vision, Judith played one of McDonald's daughters who was murdered. Judith continued to get roles in television series and made for TV movies. By the time Judith was seven, she was making over $100,000 a year. In 1985, her parents used some of her money to purchase a three-bedroom house in West Hills. But things were far from idyllic in the household. Joe was an alcoholic with a violent temper and he seemed to downright loathe his wife, Maria. He told several people he was going to kill her. He also said he might kill Judith and then himself and leave Maria alive to deal with the loss. Joe thought that Maria paid too much attention to Judith. Joe would also criticize Maria's housekeeping skills to anyone who listened to him rant about his wife. He would also take people on tours of the house and point out messes that Maria hadn't cleaned up. Joe didn't just abuse his wife. One time he pulled Judith around by her hair. Another incident was witnessed by a neighbor. Judith was flying a kite she had recently purchased. Joe came outside and grabbed the kite. Judith started crying and told him not to touch it because he would break it. Joe told the neighbor that Judith was a spoiled brat who couldn't share her new toy. Joe then proceeded to break the kite into pieces in front of Judith. 
In December 1986, Maria filed a police report. She said for the past five years, Joe had been abusing her. She said he had punched and choked her on several occasions. The police investigated the allegations, but they couldn't find any evidence to back up what Maria said, so no action was taken. Judith continued to get work on several popular television shows. This included Remington Steel, Punky Brewster, The Love Boat, St. Elsewhere, Growing Pains, and Cheers. Judith was small for her age, so she was often cast in roles of people younger than her actual age. While Judith's career was going well, she was miserable at home. She talked about how her dad was drunk every day and she knew he wanted to kill her mother. In early 1987, Maria and Judith were set to travel to the Bahamas. Judith had landed a role in Jaws The Revenge, which is the fourth movie in the Jaws franchise, and they were filming in the Bahamas. Before they left for the Bahamas, Joe held a knife and told Judith she better come home or he was going to slit her throat. After they returned from the two-month shoot, Judith's mental health got worse. She started pulling out her eyelashes and her cat's whiskers. In May 1988, Judith's agent realized how bad things had gotten. Judith was supposed to audition a song for an animated movie, but she couldn't perform because she was uncontrollably sobbing and she couldn't be consoled. The agent advised Maria to take Judith to a child psychologist. The psychologist reported the situation to Children's Services. Children's Services talked to Maria, but they didn't step in because Maria told them she had a plan which included leaving Joe. Shortly after talking to Children's Services, Maria rented an apartment. She and Judith would spend their days there and then they would return at night to live with Joe. Judith was cast to do voice work in two animated movies both were directed by Don Bluth and they were being produced by Steven Spielberg's production company. One role was the character Ducky in The Land Before Time. The other film was All Dogs Go to Heaven. Judith provided the voice for the character Anne-Marie who befriends the protagonist, a murdered dog who returns to Earth instead of going to heaven. On July 25th, 1988, Judith had an appointment at Hanna-Barbera Productions Incorporated. When Judith didn't show up, her agent called the family's home. Joe answered the phone. He said that Judith and Maria had gotten into a big car and they went to San Diego. Two days later, at about 8.30 a.m., a neighbor heard a gunshot come from the Barcy's garage. Then someone noticed that the Barcy's home was on fire. The fire became so intense that it blew out the windows in the house. Firefighters came and put the blaze out. Inside the home, they found a disturbing crime scene. The police were somewhat able to piece together what happened. 50-year-old Joe had shot his 10-year-old daughter, Judith, while she laid in bed. 48-year-old Maria may have gone to investigate the noise. Nevertheless, she was shot to death in the hallway outside of Judith's bedroom. It's believed that the murders happened on the morning of July 25, 1988, which was the day Judith missed the appointment at Hanna-Barbera. But the police also said it was possible that they were killed on July 26th. On the morning of July 27th, Joe, who was 50, poured an accelerant on their bodies and set them on fire. He then went into the garage and shot himself. The exact motive of the murders isn't known. Joe may have became angry over several things. 
For example, he may have found out that Maria was planning on leaving him, or he may have found out that Judith was seeing a psychologist. If Joe had a motive as to why he killed his family, he took that to his grave with him. The Land Before Time was released four months after Judith's murder. It was a box office hit, and it spawned over a dozen sequels. All Dogs Go to Heaven, Judith's last role, was released a year later in November 1989. The movie's theme song, Love Survives, which plays over the ending credits, is dedicated to Judith Barcy. Number 3. Mark Mosley Mark Mosley was born in March 1948 in Livingston, Texas. Nine years after he was born, his mother gave birth to a daughter, Pamela. Growing up, Mosley played football. He played quarterback in high school and in the first three years of college. In his senior year at Stephen F. Austin University, he switched to the position of place kicker. If you are not familiar with American football, place kickers kick field goals and extra points after touchdowns. In 1970, Mosley was drafted 346 overall in the 14th round by the Philadelphia Eagles. He played for them for a season and then he was dropped. Mosley then signed with the Houston Oilers. Once again, he was dropped after just one season. After he was released, no other team wanted to sign him, so he got a day job selling septic tanks. He got practicing, and he wrote letters to a dozen teams asking for a tryout. His perseverance paid off. In 1974, Mosley was signed by the Washington Redskins. Five years later, in 1979, he was voted to the Pro Bowl. In 1982, the NFL players went on strike. The strike lasted for 57 days. As a result, the season was only 9 games long instead of 16. Mosley had a fantastic season, making 20 of his 21 field goal attempts. The previous season, Washington was 8-8. Eight in 1982, Washington went 8 and 1. Washington made it to the Super Bowl where they played the Miami Dolphins. Mosley kicked two field goals and two extra points. Washington won the Super Bowl 27 17. Mosley was voted MVP, making him the first, and at the time of this video, the only special team player to be chosen as MVP. Mark Mosley retired in 1986 from the Cleveland Browns. In 1979, the same year that Mosley was voted to go to the Pro Bowl, he suffered a horrifying loss. Mosley's 21-year-old sister, Pamela Carpenter, lived in Livingston, Texas with her husband, Bruce. Pamela and Bruce had been married for three years. They lived in Houston for a short time, and their house got broken into. This unsettled them, and they became concerned about the crime rate in Houston. So they moved back to Livingston, where they grew up. At the time, Livingston had a population of around 5,000 people. On the afternoon of October 28, 1979, 21-year-old Pamela Carpenter was home alone. She was cutting out some Halloween decorations. That afternoon, Pamela called her friend. Pamela said she had been raped and stabbed. Pamela said she needed help and she told her friend to hurry. Her friend rushed to her home and saw Pamela lying in a pool of blood. She ran to a neighbor's home and the neighbor called 911. Pamela Carpenter was rushed to the hospital in an ambulance. In the ambulance, Carpenter talked about her attack. 
She said that a man had come to her door and forced his way in. He was armed with a knife. She described him as a short white male with dark curly hair and he was wearing a plaid shirt. She also said that she had met the man before. The man raped her and stabbed her in the chest with the scissors that she was using to cut out the Halloween decorations. Sadly, 21-year-old Patricia Carpenter died about two hours after the attack. Around the same time that Pamela was pronounced dead, the police made an arrest. He was 23-year-old Johnny Paul Penry. Penry had been paroled three months earlier after serving two years of a five-year sentence for rape. In February 1977, Penry approached a woman in a department store parking lot. He forced her to get into her car and then made her drive. As she drove, he pulled out a knife and directed her to a remote area. He then forced her to undress and then raped her. Afterward, they were driving and the car became stuck in the mud. So they started walking. A man in a pickup truck came by and Penry said that he and his wife needed a ride. The man allowed them to get into the back of the pickup. When they arrived at a store, the woman started screaming for help. The sheriff's department was called and Penry was arrested. He was convicted of rape and he was sentenced to five years of prison. He was released in August 1979, about three months before Pamela was killed. When the sheriff's deputy heard the description of Pamela's attacker, he immediately thought of Penry. When deputies arrived at Penry's home, he was wearing a khaki shirt. They noticed a little bit of blood soaking through the back of his shirt. Penry explained that he had fallen off his bike and cut himself. He removed his shirt and the deputies noticed two quarter inch deep cuts in his back. It looked like the cuts had been made with a pronged instrument like scissors. The deputies asked Penry if he wanted to come to a crime scene and he agreed. They drove over to Pamela Carpenter's home and Penry stayed in the back seat of the car. He told a deputy who was in the car with him that he wanted to confess. Penry was then read his Miranda rights. Penry explained that he worked part time as a delivery man for an appliance store. About three weeks earlier, he had delivered a stove to Pamela's house. He saw Pamela and he became infatuated with her. He said earlier that day, he was walking around and he saw a woman who reminded him of Pamela. He also remembered seeing money in Pamela's purse. Henry said he decided to go over and sexually assault Pamela and steal her money. Penry knocked on her door and he said he was there to check to make sure that the stove was installed correctly. Pamela opened the door, but then when she saw who it was, she tried to close it quickly. Penry said he forced his way in. Pamela grabbed a pair of scissors and stabbed him in the back. He knocked her to the ground and then stomped on her several times. He then proceeded to rape her. After he was done, he got the scissors and plunged them handle deep into her chest. He said I love her and hated to kill her, but I had to do so so she wouldn't squeal on me. But this didn't kill her. Henry said that Pamela pulled the scissors out and it freaked him out so he ran away. After confessing, Johnny Penry was charged with murder. An autopsy was performed and it seemed to back up Penry's confession. The scissors punctured Pamela's lung, but it didn't cause her death. On Pamela's stomach, 
there was a bruise in the shape of a boot print. She died from a ruptured kidney, which was most likely caused when someone stomped on her abdomen. Pamela's mother was interviewed. She said that about three weeks before the murder, she was there when Pamela had a stove delivered. Pamela had to leave the kitchen because one of the delivery men made her feel uncomfortable. In March 1980, before Penry went to trial, there was a competency hearing. Penry had been given an IQ test and he scored somewhere between 50 and 63. Anything below 70 is considered an intellectual disability. It's believed that Penry's low IQ is the result of organic brain damage that most likely stemmed from trauma to the brain at birth. He had the mental age of about six and a half to seven years old. Penry was pulled out of school after attending the first grade for a few days. When Penry was 12, his parents sent him to live at a facility for the mentally impaired. 23-year-old Johnny Penry testified at his competency hearing. He said that he could barely read or write. He said he believed in Santa Claus and he knew that Christmas was in December. He did not know who was president or who was the governor of Texas. But he did say things that indicated that he had an awareness of his actions. For example, he was asked who the 12 people in the jurors box were. He said that they were the grand jury. He was asked what the grand jury wanted to do and he responded, kill me. Penry also emphasized and made it clear that he asked the detective to write out his confession word for word. The grand jury found Penry competent to stand trial. At Penry's trial for murder in April 1980, the defense presented evidence that Penry had been abused as a child. Several people testified that he suffered horrific abuse at the hands of his mother. Then his mother testified and she admitted that she had abused her son. The defense argued that Penry's mental condition left him with poor impulse control and an inability to learn from his experiences. Therefore, he could not be held legally responsible for the murder. The jury took less than an hour to find Penry guilty. It took them just 31 minutes to decide that he should die via lethal injection. After Penry was sentenced to death, he flew into a rage and tried to attack the district attorney. Penry's conviction and death sentence were appealed. Six years later, in May 1986, Penry was given a stay of execution. He was just days away from being executed. In 1989, the United States Supreme Court made a ruling on the case. His conviction and his sentence were overturned. The Supreme Court essentially ruled that it was constitutional to execute someone with an intellectual disability. But when the jury was deciding Penry's sentence, they should have been able to consider if his intellectual disability played a role in the crime. If they considered it a mitigating factor, they could have given him a different sentence. This ruling led to laws being rewritten all over the country regarding sentencing people with intellectual disabilities. In June 1990, Penry had another competency hearing. At the hearing, the district attorney claimed that Penry wasn't as disabled as the defense claimed. They said he was slower than average, but he did not have an intellectual disability. They accused him of putting on an act to avoid responsibility for what he had done. The defense had several doctors who testified that Penry had the mental age of a seven-year-old. Once again, a jury found Penry competent, so he went to trial again in July 1990. 
His second trial was similar to the first trial. The defense argued that Penry was not responsible because of his intellectual disability. The prosecution countered that Penry was competent and he knew that his actions were wrong. The jury deliberated for two and a half hours and they found Penry guilty. After the Supreme Court ruled on Penry's case, laws were changed throughout the country regarding sentencing someone with an intellectual disability to death. Ironically, Penry didn't benefit from the ruling because the Texas legislature beats every other year. When Penry went to trial in July 1990, the laws had not been changed yet. Penry was sentenced to death a second time. Over 10 years later, on November 13, 2000, Johnny Penry was scheduled to die. Just three hours before Penry's date with the needle, he was given a stay of execution while the Supreme Court reviewed his case. On July 4, 2001, the Supreme Court voted 6-3 to overturn Penry's death sentence. In July 2002, Penry had a sentencing hearing. A month earlier, the Supreme Court ruled that it was unconstitutional to execute someone with an intellectual disability. Nevertheless, for a third time, Johnny Penry was sentenced to death. In October 2005, Penry's sentence was overturned a third time because the jury was given improper instructions on how to weigh Penry's mental disability when deciding his sentence. In February 2008, a plea deal was struck. Johnny Penry was given three life sentences without the chance of parole. In exchange, Penry had to say he was competent and that he does not have an intellectual disability. Penry spent 28 years on death row, which is more than half of his life. At the time of this video, 64-year-old Johnny Penry is incarcerated at TDCJ Hodge Unit in Rust, Texas. He spends most of his time coloring, drawing cartoon characters, and looking at comic books, which he cannot read. Pamela Carpenter's husband, Bruce, said that he is satisfied that Penry will die in prison. Pamela's father said that her murder disintegrated the family. After the murder, he and his wife essentially became strangers to each other. About a decade after the murder, they learned to tolerate each other. Today, Pamela's brother, the former NFL place kicker, Mark Mosley, is the director of franchising for Five Guys Burgers and Fries. Number 2. Dylan McDermott Mark Anthony McDermott, better known as Dylan McDermott, was born in October 1961 in Waterbury, Connecticut. Dylan was first introduced to acting by his father's third wife, Eve Ensler, who is a playwright. She is best known for writing the Vagina Monologues. Dylan's screen debut was in the 1987 film Hamburger Hill. His first significant supporting role was in 1993's In the Line of Fire. This led to him starring in the ABC legal drama The Practice. The role made Dylan a mainstream actor. For the role, Dylan was nominated for an Emmy, and in 1999, he won a Golden Globe. After starring in the practice for seven seasons, Dylan went on to star in other movies and TV series. This includes Dark Blue, The Campaign, and the first season of American Horror Story. Tragically, Dylan McDermott suffered a horrible loss in 1967. Dylan was five years old and he was living with his 20-year-old mother, Diane McDermott, and his eight-month-old sister, Robin. Diane was separated from Dylan's father. On the night of February 9, 1967, Diane's boyfriend, John Sponza, was at their apartment. 
Dylan heard them screaming at each other, which wasn't uncommon. But this time, he heard a gunshot. Dylan remembered being carried out of the apartment. He remembered seeing his mother being wheeled out on a gurney. Dylan saw a bloody bandage wrapped around her head. 20-year-old Diane McDermott was pronounced dead at the hospital. John Sponza told the police that the shooting had been an accident. He had been cleaning his gun and Diane had been peeling potatoes. She picked up the gun with her left hand and walked into the pantry. He said that the gun accidentally went off and Diane was shot in the head. The chief of inspectors, Henry Burns, thought it was a plausible story, so he closed the case. Dylan and his sister were raised by their maternal grandmother. She wanted to protect the children, so for years, Dylan didn't know that his mother had died. He thought that she was just in the hospital. He then learned that his mother had died when she was accidentally shot. Later on, her boyfriend, John Sponza, said that she actually died by suicide. In 2011, 44 years after his mother's death, Dylan McDermott got in contact with the Waterbury Police Department. He asked them to examine the details of his mother's case. Police Superintendent Michael Gugliotti was assigned to the case and he immediately noticed some problems with the case. Right away, the scene made no sense to him. The gun was found in Diane McDermott's left hand and she was shot in the left side of the back of her head. But Diane was right-handed. Also, if she did fire the gun, there would have been nitrates on her hand from the burnt gunpowder. Her hands were tested and no nitrates were found. Gugliotti spoke to people who knew Diane and two things were made clear to him. The first is that Diane hated guns and she would have never touched Spons' gun. Secondly, there is no way she would have taken her own life. Gugliotti soon learned that John Sponza was a nefarious figure. Sponza had a terrible reputation and a lengthy criminal record. When he was just 15, he was arrested twice within four days in two different states for stealing cars. He was an angry young man who would fight anyone. He was abusive to Diane and he took pleasure in humiliating her. Sponza was a heroin addict, but he also loved doing cocaine. Sponza was the suspected ringleader of a gang of bank robbers who had committed at least 11 robberies. It's believed that they stole somewhere in the range of $100,000 to $200,000. Accounting for inflation, that was about $770,000 to $1.5 million. Sponza and his gang were on the radar of the Waterbury Police and the FBI. Sponza and his crew were also the suspects in several murders. On February 3rd, 1967, a man named Harold Unsworth was found shot to death in his car. Unsworth, who was 27, had spent a third of his life incarcerated. He had connections to organized crime. John Sponza was the prime suspect in the case, but he was never charged. Unsworth was murdered just six days before Diane McDermott was killed. Five years later, in May 1972, John Sponza got his four gang members into a car. He was in the passenger seat and his partner, James Latta, was driving. In the back seat were Alexander Jadovich, Peter Lattis, and William McNeilis. Suddenly, Sponza pulled out two guns and opened fire on the men in the back seat. Lattis and McNeilis were closest to the doors, so they got out quickly. Lattis was grazed with a bullet, and McNeilis wasn't shot. 
Shalovich was in the middle seat, and he wasn't as fortunate. He was shot to death. What happened to his body is unknown, but it's never been found. A few weeks later, on June 16th, 1972, the police of Waltham, Connecticut came across a Dodge Charger that rental company had reported missing. It had been rented by John Sponza. An officer got the trunk open and inside of it was the dead body of 28-year-old John Sponza. He had been shot three times in the back. The medical examiner thought he had been dead for at least a week. No one has ever been charged in connection with Sponza's murder. After Michael Gugliotti reopened Diane McDermott's case, he talked to some informants and people who were associated with Sponza's gang. He believes that Peter Laddis ordered the hit and James Latta and William McNeilis carried out the actual shooting. Gugliotti also developed a theory as to why Diane McDermott was killed. She possibly knew about the first murder that Sponza committed, the shooting of Harold Unsworth. She may have even threatened to go to the police. Sponza shot her to make sure she didn't talk to anyone. With all the oddities for the crime scene and John Sponza being a known criminal, why did the chief of inspectors, Henry Burns, close the case so quickly? It turned out that there were significant problems with the Waterbury Police Department. Burns ended up leaving the force in disgrace two years after Diane's murder. What exactly happened has never been made public. What is known is that in March 1969, Burns and his deputy went to the home of the state attorney. They were drunk and they caused some type of disturbance in front of his home. Burns and his deputy were arrested and convicted of disturbing the peace and public intoxication. On top of a three-month suspended sentence, Burns was suspended from the force and then he resigned. Around the same time that Burns was suspended, his department was being investigated on corruption allegations. Four police officers were charged with accepting stolen goods. Burns was not one of them, but there are allegations that he was not on the straight and narrow. Henry Burns passed away in the year 2000 at the age of 83. Police Superintendent Michael Gugliotti said that if Johnny Sponzo were alive today, he would be charged with Diane McDermott's murder. Dylan McDermott did not comment on the results of the investigation. When Dylan first talked to Gugliotti, Gugliotti asked him why he wanted to examine his mother's case after 44 years. Dylan said, in order for me to survive, to get to where I am today, I needed to bury that moment in my life deep within myself. I've come to the point in my life where I'm able to begin to process all of this. Dylan's sister, Robin Herrera, said that the investigation results gave her a sense of relief. She said, I'm happy to know my mother wasn't mentally ill or depressed. Somebody took her from us. She didn't leave us. Number 1. Kelsey Grammer Alan Kelsey Grammer was born on February 21, 1955, in St. Thomas, U.S. Virgin Islands. Sixteen months later, his mother, Sally, gave birth to a daughter, Karen. Shortly after Karen's birthday, Sally divorced the father of her two children, Alan Grammer. After the divorce, Sally, Kelsey, and Karen moved to New Jersey. When Kelsey was in his pre-teens, the family relocated to Florida. After high school, Kelsey attended the Juilliard School. He did some stage acting. He had bit parts on several TV series after Juilliard. In 1984, Kelsey Grammer landed the role that he is best known for, Dr. Fraser Crane. 
Kelsey was only supposed to do the character for six episodes on the hit show Cheers, but he was made a series regular and he portrayed the character for the next nine seasons. In 1993, Kelsey starred in the spin-off show Frasier. Frasier was a massive success. Kelsey Grammer was nominated for an Emmy for all 11 seasons that the show was on the air. He won four times. He also won two Golden Globes. Kelsey has won an additional Emmy for voicing Sideshow Bob on The Simpsons, and he won a Golden Globe for his role on the star's political drama, Boss. While Kelsey Grammer has had fantastic success in his career, he has also suffered terrible losses. When Kelsey, his mother, and his sister left St. Thomas, his father, Alan, stayed behind. Alan was a bit of a controversial figure in the city. He owned a music store, a coffee shop, and a bar. He also owned and operated a magazine called The Virgin Island View. In the spring of 1967, Alan planned to announce that he was running for political office. After Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated on April 4, 1967, there was some racial unrest in St. Thomas. On the day of Dr. King's funeral, April 9, 1967, a St. Thomas taxi driver named Arthur Bevan Niles went on a bit of a rampage. He tried to burn a house down, but he was unsuccessful. He then went to the airport and tried to set two cars on fire, but he couldn't get the fires going. He drove to a telephone company and tried to bomb it, but the bomb didn't explode. Around midnight, Niles drove to Alan Grammer's home. He set Alan's car on fire. Alan stepped outside to see what was going on, and he was shot twice. Alan died at the scene in the arms of his second wife. Arthur Niles was arrested shortly after the shooting. He later pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Before he went to trial, there was a competency hearing and he was found competent to stand trial. It's not clear what happened after the hearing, but it's believed that Niles was convicted of the murder and he was incarcerated possibly for decades. Kelsey Grammer was 13 and living in Florida when his father was murdered. Sadly, Kelsey's father was not the only person in his family to be murdered. Just over seven years later, on July 1st, 1975, the police in Colorado Springs, Colorado were called to a trailer park. The body of a young woman had been found by the manager of the park. The woman's body was in front of the door of the park's office. She had no pieces of identification on her. The woman had been stabbed in the neck, the back, and the hand. The hand wounds were most likely from defending herself. According to the blood trail, she had been stabbed in an alley leading into the trailer park. She walked down the alley and came into the trailer park. Blood was found on the doors of two mobile homes near the office. It appeared that the woman tried to seek help at both homes, but no one came to the door. She then made her way to the office, but no one was there and she died in front of the door. For a week, the woman remained unidentified. Then a man reported his roommate missing. He had not seen her in a week. His roommate was 18-year-old Karen Grammer. Her 20-year-old brother, Kelsey Grammer, flew to Colorado Springs and identified the body found in the trailer park as his sister. After Karen was identified, the detective learned something that he thought couldn't be a coincidence. Karen was a waitress at Red Lobster. On the same night that Karen was murdered, she wasn't on duty, but there was an attempted robbery at the restaurant. 
The employees who were working that night told the police that three young black men came to the restaurant as they were closing. Only one of the men came into the restaurant. He was described as militant. The other two men stood near the door. The employees explained to the robber that the money had already been locked in the safe and they couldn't open the safe until the morning. So the robbers left empty-handed. The lead detective on the case thought that the killer lived close to the trailer park and he or she was familiar with the area. Close to the alley where Karen was stabbed was an apartment complex. The detective decided to ask the apartment complex manager if he had any men that matched the description of the robbers living in the complex. He said that he did, but the men had moved out just a few weeks earlier. They were Freddie Glenn, Larry Dunn, and Michael Corbett. Glenn was 18 years old, and he worked as a civilian employee at Fort Carson. 20-year-old Michael Corbett and Larry Dunn were soldiers at Fort Carson. The detective talked to the man's former neighbors. One of the neighbors said that a fourth man usually crashed with them. He was 21-year-old Winslow Watson. Watson's dead body had been found on the side of the road on July 25, 1975, about three and a half weeks after Karen's murder. He had been shot three times in the head. The neighbors told the detective that they were worried that something they said to Corbett got Watson killed. They complained to Corbett that Watson had stolen a loaf of bread from their refrigerator. The detective was able to track down associates of the men and he learned that the men may have been on a killing spree over the last few months. The detective located Larry Dunn. Dunn was living in New Orleans, Louisiana. In exchange for immunity, Dunn told the detective about the murders that Freddie Glenn and Michael Corbett committed. It started on June 19, 1975. Dunn said he was hanging out with Corbett and Glenn. Dunn admitted that he came up with the idea to rob someone. They came across 29-year-old Daniel Van Lone. Van Lone had just finished his shift as a cook at the Four Seasons. Dunn said that Corbett blindfolded him and had him lie on the ground. Then Corbett shot Van Lone in the head. Besides stealing his life, they also stole 50 cents from Van Lone. Eight days later, on June 27, 1975, Glenn and Corbett came across two men looking to buy marijuana. Glenn stayed in the car, and one of the men, 19-year-old Winford Prophet, went with Corbett to the waterfront. Corbett stabbed Prophet several times with a bayonet. Prophet died as a result of his wounds. Three nights later, Glenn, Corbett, and a third man, 20-year-old Eric McLeod, went to rob the Red Lobster, but they didn't get any money. They came across Karen Grammer in the parking lot as they were leaving. Karen had not worked that night. She had gone to the restaurant to meet up with her boyfriend, who was finishing up his shift. The three men kidnapped her because they thought she might be able to identify them. Dunn said they picked him up after they kidnapped Karen. Then they went and robbed a 7-Eleven store. After the robbery, they went back to their apartment. Over the next four hours, they took turns repeatedly raping Karen. Then they drove her to the alley. They told her that they were going to let her live. But then, Freddie Glenn put a hood over her head and started stabbing her. They drove away, leaving her to die. Three and a half weeks later, Michael Corbett was drinking with 20-year-old Winslow Watson on the side of the road. 
completely unprovoked, Corbett shot him three times in the head. Dunn confirmed that Watson had been killed because he had stolen a loaf of bread from the neighbors. On August 30th, 1975, 19-year-old Ricky Lewis was playing dice outside of a nightclub. He was shot in the back with a shotgun and died within minutes. It's suspected that Michael Corbett was the shooter. After talking to Larry Dunn, the police arrested 20-year-old Michael Corbett and 18-year-old Freddie Glenn. Then more people came forward and said that the two men had bragged about the murders they committed. Michael Corbett was charged with the murders of Daniel Van Loan, Winifred Prophet, Winslow Watson, and Ricky Lewis. Freddie Glenn was charged with the murders of Van Loan, Watson, and Karen Grammer. The trials for all the murders were done individually in 1976. Corbett ended up only going to trial for the murders of Van Loan, Prophet, and Watson. He was found guilty in each case. He was never tried for the murder of Ricky Lewis, but he is the only suspect. Corbett was sentenced to death for killing Prophet, and for the other two convictions, he was sentenced to life. Freddie Glenn was found guilty of the murders of Watson, Van Loan, and Karen Grammer. For the murders of Watson and Van Loan, he was given a life sentence. For Karen's murder, he was sentenced to death. In 1978, Colorado abolished the death penalty and the death sentences were commuted to life sentences with the chance of parole. Michael Corbett applied for parole in April 1996, 20 years after he was convicted. He was denied parole that time and every other time he applied. Michael Corbett died in prison from natural causes in July 2019 at the age of 64. He had served 43 years of prison. Freddie Glenn was first able to apply for parole in 2006. At the time, he waived his right to apply. He waived his right again in 2007. In July 2009, Freddie Glenn applied for parole for the first time. He had spent 33 years of prison. Kelsey Grammer testified at the parole hearing and he said he did not think that Glenn should be paroled. He called him a butcher and a monster. He said that there was no guarantee that Glenn wouldn't hurt anyone else if he was released. Glenn was ultimately denied parole. Once again, Kelsey Grammer testified. He said that he accepted Glenn's apology and he forgave him. But he could not approve of Glenn being released and he thinks he should die in prison. At the time of this video, Freddie Glenn is 63 years old and he is incarcerated at the Fremont Correctional Facility in Canyon City, Colorado. Glenn's next parole hearing is in May 2021. Number 3. Claudine Loger Claudine Loger was born on January 29, 1942, in Paris, France. Her mother was a physician, and her father owned a company that manufactured X-ray equipment. In her late teens, Loger moved to Las Vegas, Nevada to be a professional dancer. She got a job with La Folie's Berger Dance Troupe, which performed at the Tropicana Hotel. In 1960, when Langer was 19, she and her friend were driving along the Las Vegas Strip. As Langer drove, the car started to have problems. They were forced to get out and push the car. Then the car pulled up behind them. The passengers of the car were singer Andy Williams and his manager. Williams said he stopped partly because he wanted to be a good Samaritan 
but he was also struck by how beautiful Langer was. Even though Langer didn't speak English and Williams didn't speak French, they went out for dinner that evening. They started dating and then they were married on December 15, 1961. In 1962, Williams recorded a cover of the song, Moon River. Moon River was initially performed by Audrey Hepburn for the movie Breakfast at Tiffany's. The song was a massive hit for Williams and it launched him into the world of superstardom. It would go on to be the defining hit of his career. In early 1963, Claudine Langer had her first television role. She had two guest spots on the ABC sitcom, McHale's Navy. This led to more guest spots on other shows like Hogan's Heroes and 12 O'Clock High. In September 1963, Langer gave birth to a daughter. This was followed by a son in April 1965. In 1963, Andy Williams began his run starring in his own variety show, the aptly titled The Andy Williams Show. Langer started making guest appearances on the show, beginning with the first season's New Year's Eve special in 1963. In 1966, while Williams was rehearsing for his show, Robert F. Kennedy came into the studio. At the time, Robert was a senator for the state of New York and he was doing an interview in a different studio. Robert told Williams that he and his wife, Ethel, were big fans of the show. After that initial meeting, Robert and Ethel became close friends with Williams and Langer. Also in 1966, Langer appeared in the season finale of the NBC television program, Run For Your Life. She performed a bilingual version of the bossa nova hit, Meditation by Antonio Carlos Jobim. The co-founder of A&M Records saw the show and he was impressed by Langer. He signed her to a record deal. Her first album, Claudine, was released a year later. It reached number 11 on the Billboard Top 200. Langer would go on to record five albums with A&M, and they were all moderate hits. She also continued to act. Langer's most prominent role was starring opposite Peter Sellers in the comedy The Party, which was released in the spring of 1968. She also made regular appearances on her husband's show. She would also make appearances on other variety shows such as This Is Tom Jones and The Bobby Darren Amusement Company. Angers was also a guest on late night talk shows like The Merv Griffith Show and The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Williams and Langer were possibly going to meet up with Robert and Ethel Kennedy after midnight on June 5th, 1968. Robert was running to be the Democratic candidate for the 1968 presidential election. They were all going to possibly meet up after Robert gave a speech at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. However, just after midnight, as Robert was walking through the hotel's kitchen, he was shot by 24-year-old Sirhan Sirhan. After he was shot, Williams and Langer went to the hospital where they met with Robert's family. 42-year-old Robert F. Kennedy died the next day from his injuries. In August 1969, Langer gave birth to a son. They named him Robert in honor of their murdered friend. Williams and Langer's marriage did not last much longer. In November 1970, it became public that Williams and Langer had separated. However, they remained friends. Langer continued to act, record albums, and she made appearances on variety shows and talk shows. Sometime after the split, Langer met world champion American skier 
Vladimir Sabig, who went by the nickname Spider. Sabig's father started calling him Spider just after his birth because he had been born premature and he had thin arms and legs. Sabig was three years younger than Langer and he lived in Aspen, Colorado. Although Sabig had been born and raised in California, he was beloved in Aspen and he was considered a local hero. For a few years, Langer split her time between Aspen and Malibu. Then in 1975, five years after their split up, Williams and Langer officially divorced. Langer and her children moved in with Sabic in Aspen. By that time, Spider Sabic was nearing the end of his impressive career, which included finishing fifth at the Solemn Races at the 1968 Olympics. His career as a skier was coming to an end because of a series of injuries. There were rumors that even after Langer moved in with Sabic, he continued to see other women. It's not known if Langer knew about the other women, but it is doubtful she would have put up with it. Langer was described as a very intense person, and she was in constant need of Sabic's attention. Several people remembered an incident at a nightclub when Langer threw a bottle at Sabic. According to Langer, Sabic was not paying enough attention to her. In March 1976, Sabic ended his relationship with Langer and he asked her to move out. A couple of weeks later, on the morning of March 21, 1976, Sabic and Langer went out skiing on different trails. That afternoon, Sabic went to a friend's home for a small get-together. He drank several beers. After Langer finished skiing, she went to a bar and drank a few glasses of wine. She then went shopping. At 5 p.m. they were both at home, as were Langer's three children. Savig was planning on attending a party that evening. At about 5.05 p.m. a call came in to the emergency line at the local hospital. About 20 minutes later, an ambulance arrived at their home. The paramedics went into the bathroom and they found Langer holding a dying Sabic in her arms. Sabic had been getting ready to shower when he was shot in the abdomen with a 22 caliber pistol. He was not bleeding much, but the bullet had done some severe internal damage. Langer volunteered to give him heart compressions and the paramedics allowed her. She rode in the ambulance, and she continued to give heart compressions. But unfortunately, Vladimir Spider Sabic, who was 31, died on the way to the hospital. People in Aspen were distraught over Sabic's death. He had been a large part of their community for some time, and they considered Langer an outsider. People were also really upset by how she acted at his funeral. She had walked from the back of the service to stand front and center and she even picked a flower off his casket. Two weeks after the shooting, Langer, who was 34, was charged with reckless manslaughter. Langer claimed that the shooting was an accident. She claimed that Savage had been showing her how the gun worked and that it accidentally went off. Three months after the shooting, Saturday Night Live did a skit where Langer hosted a skiing competition called the Claudine Langer Invitational. The skit had footage of professional skiers wiping out with the sound of gunshots playing over them to make it look like the skiers crashed because they had been shot. Andy Williams was supportive of his ex-wife and he threatened to sue Saturday Night Live. The next week, Saturday Night Live issued their first ever apology for making light of a real crime. Claudine Langer went to trial for reckless manslaughter in January 1977. It was one of America's first celebrity trials. 
She was looking at a sentence of 10 years in prison if she was found guilty. But the district attorney's case suffered two major blows. The first is that the police didn't get a search warrant before they confiscated Langer's diary. In the diary, Langer details the decline of her relationship with Sabic, which would have spoken to motive. Langer was also forced to give a blood and a urine sample without a warrant. It turned out that at the time of Sabic's shooting, Langer had cocaine in her system. But since the evidence was not properly collected, the jury did not get to hear about any of it. The trial lasted four days. Andy Williams was there every day to support his ex-wife and the mother of his children. He even testified on her behalf. Langer also testified. She claimed that the shooting was an accident and she loved Sabig. She said that she respected life too much to have killed him on purpose. The jury deliberated for three hours and 40 minutes. Langer was found not guilty of reckless manslaughter, but she was found guilty of a lesser charge, criminally negligent homicide, which was a misdemeanor. The maximum sentence was two years in jail and a fine of $5,000. On January 31st, 1976, Langer had her sentencing hearing. She begged for mercy on behalf of her children. For killing 31-year-old Spire Sabig, Claudine Langer was fined $250 and she was sentenced to 30 days in the county jail. She was allowed to choose when she served the 30 days. The judge was expecting her to serve it in the summer when her kids weren't in school. But right after the trial, Langer moved to Mexico with her defense lawyer, Ron Austin. Austin had abandoned his family to be with Langer. Over the next several years, Langer eventually served her sentence, mostly on weekends. She and Austin got married in June 1985 and they settled in Aspen. After the trial, Claudine Langer stayed away from the public eye. It's believed she still lives in Aspen. At the time of this video, she is 79 years old. Number 2. Don King Donald King was born on August 20th, 1931 in Cleveland, Ohio. When King was 18, he went to university, supposedly with the goal of being a lawyer. To help pay for his tuition, he became a numbers runner. A numbers runner records and collects illegal bets. King was smart and he had a head for numbers. It wasn't long before he moved off from being numbers runner to a numbers bank, which is basically the house. They are the person who pays out on the bets and keeps the money when the better loses. King was successful and the dream of being a lawyer soon became a distant memory. On December 2nd, 1954, King, who was 23, went to one of his gambling houses in Cleveland. He caught three men trying to rob the house. A gunfight broke out and King shot a man named Hillary Brown in the back, killing him. The death was ruled a justifiable homicide, and King was not charged with anything. After the shooting, King continued to grow his empire. Besides being a numbers banker, he owned several businesses. By the mid-1960s, he was making about $15,000 a day. On April 20th, 1966, 36-year-old Don King walked into a bar on Cleveland's Cedar Avenue. It had been 13 years since he shot Hillary Brown to death. King rarely went anywhere without his gun, and that day was no different. When King got into the bar, he saw one of his former employees, a man named Sam Barrett. 
Barido King, $600. Barrett was described as a sickly man. He recently had surgery to get one of his kidneys removed. He also had tuberculosis in his left lung. Despite his poor health, Barrett abused drugs. King weighed over 100 pounds more than Barrett. King and Barrett started arguing, and then their fight spilled out onto Cedar Avenue. King knocked Barrett down, and while he held his gun, he kicked and stomped Barrett in the head. Barrett kept saying he would pay him the money, but he eventually lost consciousness. The being attracted a group of onlookers, but no one intervened, even when it was clear that Barrett couldn't defend himself. Two police officers happened to pull up to the bar during the beating. One of the officers got out of the car, pulled out a service revolver, and aimed it at King. He ordered King to put his gun down. King did as he was told, and then he gave Barrett another vicious kick to the head. Barrett was in a coma for five days, and then he passed away. At the police station after the beating, Don King said he acted in self-defense. He said that Barrett had taken the first swing at him. After Sam Barrett died, King was charged with second-degree murder. When King went to trial in July 1967, most of the witnesses did not show up to testify. The FBI investigated the case and they thought that King had paid over $30,000 to pay off witnesses. The only witness was the police officer who arrested King. The jury deliberated for four hours, and they found King guilty of second-degree murder. For the conviction, King was looking at a possible life sentence. Then, something odd happened. The judge, Hugh Corrigan, met with King and his lawyer in private. No one from the district attorney's office was at the meeting. The day after Don King was convicted of second-degree murder by a jury, Judge Corrigan reduced his conviction to manslaughter. Journalist Jack Newfield wrote a book about King, and he discovered that the FBI believed that Judge Corrigan was corrupt. King ended up being sentenced to 1 to 20 years of prison. In 1979, King was released from prison. For stomping a man to death, he served about 3 years and 11 months. After King got out of prison, he was introduced to the most famous boxer in the world, Muhammad Ali, by a mutual friend. King convinced Ali to find a charity match for a Cleveland hospital. This was the start of King's career as a boxing promoter. In 1974, King set up a fight between Ali and George Foreman. He promised both fighters $5 million. The problem was that King didn't have $10 million and he was having issues finding backers. He then somehow got in contact with Mobutu Sese Seko, who was the dictator of Zaire, which is now known as the Democratic Republic of Congo. Sese Seko offered to put up the money, but the fight needed to happen in Zaire. King agreed, and the fight was billed, the rumble in the jungle. The event was considered controversial because Zaire was an impoverished country that did not have an extra $10 million to spend on a sporting event. The fight happened on October 30th, 1974, in Kinshasa, Zaire. Muhammad Ali knocked out the previously undefeated George Foreman in the seventh round. It's estimated that a billion people from around the world watched it on pay-per-view. The country of Zaire ended up losing $5 million for hosting the fight. The famous match solidified King as one of the most prominent boxing promoters in the world. Throughout his career, King has been accused of ripping off business associates 
the fighters he promoted. Nevertheless, King was a dominant force in the world of heavyweight boxing for decades. He also became a cultural icon and more famous than many of the boxers he promoted. In 1983, King was granted a pardon for his manslaughter conviction by the governor of Ohio. Sam Barrett's widow was bitter about the pardon. She said she wished that the governor could have seen Barrett after the beating he took. While Don King's career has been marred with controversy, he never killed anyone else. In 2016, the city of Cleveland announced that they were going to rename a segment of a street to Don King Way. For some reason that was never made clear, they were going to rename a segment of Cedar Avenue. In the middle of that segment is the place where he kicked and stomped Sam Barrett to death. Many citizens were upset by the proposal and it was soon quashed. Don King is currently 88 years old and he apparently still does some boxing promoting but is nothing like the promoting he did in the 1980s and 90s. Number 1. Jack Unterweger Vienna, Austria is a peaceful city with a low crime rate. The city was shocked on May 20th, 1991, when the body of 25-year-old Sabine Moitzi was found in the Vienna woods. Moitzi had been reported missing a month earlier by her husband. She was last seen alive on April 18th, 1991, by a friend who dropped her off at an intersection in one of the rougher neighborhoods in Vienna. Moitzi worked as a bakery saleswoman during the day and unbeknownst to many of her friends and family, including her husband, she did sex work at night. Moitzi had been strangled to death with her stockings, which were still wrapped around her neck when her body was found. Three days later, 24-year-old Karen Aragu's body was found in the Vienna woods. Aragu, who was a sex worker, was last seen alive about two weeks earlier, on May 7th. She was last seen a few blocks from where Moitzi had been working three weeks earlier. She had been strangled to death with her leotards, which were still tied around her neck. The detective investigating the murder soon learned that other sex workers had gone missing within the same month as Moitzi and Aragu. 23-year-old Sylvia Zegler vanished on April 8, 1991. This was about eight days before Moitzi was last seen alive. Zegler's remains wouldn't be found until months later, on August 4, 1991. Like the other two sets of remains, Zegler's remains were found in the Vienna woods. Regina Prem went missing on April 28 about 12 days after Moitzi was presumably killed. Prem's remains were found over a year later. Because of the state of the remains, a cause of death could not be determined. The police were sure that one person was responsible for all four murders. All four women were sex workers who went missing within a month of each other. All their remains were found in the Vienna woods, and at least three of them had been strangled with a piece of their own clothing. The presumed serial murders attracted a lot of media attention. One journalist who was particularly interested in the case was a man named Jack Unterweger. Jack was recording a story for Austria's National Public Service Broadcaster, the Austria Broadcasting Corporation, which is known by the acronym the ORF. For the story, Jack interviewed Vienna's chief of police. Jack's radio segment aired on June 5, 1991. The chief of police listened to Jack's segment with his wife. The chief had never heard of Jack Unterweger before he met him, but his wife knew who he was because Jack was famous in Austria. Jack Unterweger was born in August 1950 in Austria. He claimed that his mother was a sex worker and his father was an American GI. Jack never knew his father. 
When Jack was a toddler, his mother was arrested for fraud and he was sent to live with his grandfather. Jack claimed that his grandfather was cold and distant from him and they lived in poverty. He also said that at times he was forced to sleep in the same bed as his grandfather. Jack said that other times his grandfather would bring home women, often sex workers, and he would have sex with them in the same room as him. Years later, Jack's aunt said that what he said about his childhood were lies. For example, Jack had his own bedroom. When Jack's aunt confronted him about his lies, Jack pretended he didn't know who she was. Jack lived with his grandfather for two years and then he was put into a series of foster homes. Jack said that when he was a teenager, he went looking for his mother. He claims he didn't find her, but he did find his aunt, Anna, and he had a good relationship with her. He said that his aunt was a sex worker. In 1967, when Jack was 17, he said that his aunt was killed by one of her clients. Jack had his first brush with the law when he was 16. He was arrested for theft. Between October 1971 and January 1973, Jack was in prison for auto theft. It's believed that a few months after he was released, Jack committed his first murder. He was 22 years old at the time. On April 1st, 1973, the body of a woman was found in a lake in Salzburg, Austria. She was nude from the waist down. Her wrists had been bound with a necktie and her ankles were tied up with pantyhose. It appeared that the killer had punched her multiple times in the face. The medical examiner determined that she had been dragged or carried out into the lake while she was bound and she drowned. The medical examiner thought she had only been dead for a few hours. The morning after the body was pulled from the lake, a man reported his wife missing. He identified the body as his wife, 25-year-old Marika Horvath. For two years, the case set cold. Then the lead detective learned that a 24-year-old man named Jack Unterweger had recently been arrested for sexually assaulting four women and murdering another woman. Jack caught the attention of the detective because of what he did to one of his victims who survived. He had attempted to sexually assault her near a body of water. He had bound her with her own clothes and punched her in the face several times. The young woman thought she only survived the attack because someone happened upon the assault and Jack was forced to stop. The murder that Jack was arrested for happened in December 1974. At the time, Jack was dating a young woman named Barbara Scholes. On the night of December 11, 1974, Jack and Scholes drove to Scholes' parents' home in Eversba, which is a small town in Germany. They were planning on sneaking into Scholes' parents' home and stealing some money and items. But when they got there, they found the house locked and her parents were asleep. Jack decided they should rob another house. Then they saw 18-year-old Margaret Schaefer walking home. Growing up, Schaefer and Scholz had been neighbors and they had gone to school together. Schaefer had spent the night bowling with friends. Scholz invited Schaefer to come for a drive with them. She accepted and she got into the car. At some point, Jack stopped the car and assaulted Schaefer. He made her undress and then he bound her wrist with his belt. Then they drove out to a wooded area. Jack led Schaefer out into the woods while Scholl stayed in the car. He returned to the car about 15 minutes later with a metal rod that had blood on it. 18-year-old Margaret Schaefer was not with him. They drove for a while and then they ditched Schaefer's clothes and the metal rod. 
About three weeks later, Margaret Schaefer's body was found in the woods. The medical examiner determined she had been beaten in the head with a blunt object and manually strangled. Then finally, she was strangled with her bra. The bra was still around her neck when she was found. About two months later, Jack and Schultz were arrested in Basel, Switzerland. They had a 16-year-old friend, and they were trying to scam her friend's parents by pretending she had been kidnapped and demanding a ransom. The girl's parents notified the police, and they set up a sting that led to the arrest of Scholes and Jack. When Jack was arrested, he was very familiar to the police because four women had accused him of sexually assaulting them. The police figured out that Barbara Scholes had lived on the same street as Margaret Schaefer. Since Jack had a history of assaulting women, the police decided to question Scholes about Schaefer's murder. She admitted that Jack had killed her. Jack was subsequently charged with Schaefer's murder. In Austrian law, one of their citizens can be tried for a murder that they may have committed in another country. So Jack Underweger was tried for the murder of Margaret Schaefer in Austria. At Jack's murder trial, he said that Schaefer reminded him of his mother and he suddenly became angry because he remembered how she abandoned him. He was convicted and he was sentenced to life in prison. He was sent to Stein Prison in Donau, Austria. The detective who was investigating the April 1973 murder of 25-year-old Marika Horvath wanted Jack to be charged with her murder as well. But the prosecutor chose not to charge Jack with the murder because Jack had already been given a life sentence and he could only be sentenced to life once. As a result, Horvath's murder remained officially unresolved. Before Jack went to prison, he was illiterate. In prison, Jack took correspondent classes on writing and literature. He then began writing children's stories. He submitted them to the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation. They ended up broadcasting about 50 of his stories. In 1982, a magazine published Jack's autobiography entitled Purgatory in serial form. The next year, Purgatory was published in book form. The book was a bestseller. In 1988, the book was adapted into a film which played in the theaters and aired on television. When it debuted at a film festival in Austria, Jack was allowed to leave prison to attend the opening. While Jack was in prison, he published six more books. Jack also wrote a play, and once again, he was allowed to leave the prison to attend the premiere. When Jack got to the theater, he was greeted by fans and paparazzi. The intellectual elites in Austria did not think that such a gifted person should be sitting behind bars. Starting in 1985, several influential people wrote letters to the Austrian government encouraging them to parole Jack. It appeared that the letters paid off. Jack Unterweger was paroled from prison on May 23, 1990. He had spent about 15 years and four months in prison. It was the minimal amount of time he could have served on a life sentence. When Jack got out of prison, he was a full-fledged celebrity in Austria. Over the next several months, he was on the cover of many of the national magazines and he also appeared on talk shows. He went on dates with prominent Austrian actresses and models. He went on tour with a play he wrote, directed, and starred in called Dungeon. In February 1991, he produced another play called Scream of Fear, which is about a man who contracts AIDS. Using a government grant, he went on a seven city tour. On June 11, 1991, 
Jack traveled to Los Angeles, California. When he got there, he checked into the infamous Cecil Hotel. It's supposedly one of the last places Elizabeth Short, aka the Black Dahlia, visited before she was murdered in January 1947. It's also believed that serial killer Richard Ramirez had spent several weeks in the hotel. Decades later, 21-year-old Elisa Lamb mysteriously drowned in the water tank on the roof of the hotel. While Jack was in Los Angeles, he tried to track down several celebrities so he could interview them, but he didn't have any luck. One thing he managed to do was get a four-hour ride-along with an LAPD patrol car. He also wrote an article about prostitution in Los Angeles for an Austrian magazine. He tried to pitch his autobiography to people associated with the movie industry, but he did not have any success. When Jack returned to Vienna in mid-July, he was one of the leading suspects in the Vienna Woods murders. In the fall of 1991, the police departments in two other Austrian cities got in contact with the Vienna Police Department. They had experienced similar murders. The first one happened in Graz. Graz is the second most populous city in Austria and it's about 125 miles south of Vienna. The first woman went missing from there on October 26, 1990. This was a little over half a year before the first woman in Vienna was killed and six months after Jack was paroled. She was 39-year-old sex worker Brunhilde Masser. Her body was found in a wooded area two months after she went missing. She had been strangled to death with some type of fabric. Four months later, on the night of March 7, 1991, 35-year-old sex worker Alfreda Strimp went missing. Her skeletal remains were found seven months later in a wooded area just outside the city. Most of her clothes were missing. Because of the state of the remains, the medical examiner could not say with any certainty what the cause of death was. However, the skeleton had no signs of trauma, so he thought she had been strangled to death. The other murder happened in the city of Bergenz on December 5, 1990. This is in between the two murders at Graz. On that night, 31-year-old Heidi Marie Hammerer had been working her usual street corner. Her body was found about three weeks later in a marsh. It appeared she had been strangled to death with a pair of tights. In November 1991, 41-year-old Jack Unterweger started dating an 18-year-old woman. By Christmas, they were engaged to be married. Around the same time, the police in Vienna and Graz were desperate to arrest Jack, but they didn't have any physical evidence that would be considered the smoking gun. Jack was interviewed by detectives in both cities. He provided alibis for the nights of the murders but none of them checked out. Some other sex workers had went to the police and told them that Jack had taken them to an isolated area and then was rough with them. The police thought that these actions matched the killer's M.O. The only difference was, for whatever reason, Jack didn't kill them. Jack denied ever meeting any of the sex workers but all the sex workers had picked him out of a photo lineup. They were also able to identify him because he drove a car with a personalized license plate that contained his name. So the police believed the women's stories and they thought that Jack was lying. This solidified their belief that Jack really was the killer. In mid-February, Jack Unterweger went to a photo shoot. The photographer was friends with several police officers and he mentioned to Jack that the police were investigating him. Jack had assumed the police believed his alibis and they were no longer investigating him. 
When he learned that the police still considered him a suspect, he became spooked. On February 13, 1992, an arrest warrant was issued for Jack. But when officers went to arrest Jack, he was nowhere to be found. It turned out that he had took off with his 18-year-old fiance. But where they went was a mystery. While Jack was on the run, he called in to the Austrian Broadcasting Corporation and he proclaimed his innocence. Many people believed him and they thought he was a victim of a witch hunt. On February 26, 1992, less than two weeks after the arrest warrant was issued, the police in Vienna received a tip that Jack and his fiance were in Miami, Florida. The next day, Jack was arrested by U.S. Marshals. Jack decided not to fight extradition and he volunteered to return to Austria. This surprised a lot of people. Then, just over a week after Jack was arrested, the reason why he wasn't fighting extradition became clear. The United States Justice Department got in contact with the Los Angeles Police Department. They told them that between June 11th and July 16th, 1991, Jack Unterweger was in Los Angeles. The representative from the Justice Department suggested that they should look at their unsolved cases to see if they had any sex workers who had been strangled to death while Jack was in Los Angeles. They also said that the victim was most likely strangled with a piece of their own clothing. It turned out that the LAPD did have several murders that could have been committed by Jack Unterweger. On the morning of June 20th, 1991, the body of a dead, mostly nude woman was found in a vacant lot. She had been strangled with her own bra, which was still wrapped around her neck. The woman's fingerprints were entered into the system and a match was found. The body was 20-year-old Shannon Exley. Exley had been a sex worker who was addicted to crack cocaine and she had been arrested several times. Just over a week later, the body of another woman was found in an industrial area of Los Angeles. Like Exley, she had been strangled with her own bra. She was identified as 33-year-old Irene Rodriguez. Also like Exley, she was a sex worker. Days later, on July 10th, 26-year-old sex worker, Peggy Jean Booth, who also went by the name Sherry Ann Long, was strangled to death. Her body was found in a canyon eight days later. She had been strangled with her bra, which remained tied around her neck. Then the murder suddenly stopped. Detectives in Vienna met with detectives with the LAPD. They compared the murders committed in their respective cities and concluded that one killer was responsible for all of them. So it's believed that Jack did not fight extradition because he did not want to be prosecuted in California. The first reason he didn't want to go to trial in California is that they had the death penalty. The second reason was that he wasn't a celebrity in California. But it turned out that the authorities in Los Angeles were not going to charge him because they did not have any physical evidence to connect him to the murders of the three women. On May 28, 1992, Jack Unterweger arrived back in Vienna. Around the same time, one of the Viennese investigators on the case was at a conference in Prague, Czech Republic. Prague is about 180 miles from Vienna. The investigator learned that the police in Prague were investigating a murder that was remarkably similar to the ones committed in Austria and Los Angeles. On September 15, 1990, 30-year-old Blanka Bakova was walking home in Prague. Her mostly nude body was found the next day in a wooded area just outside of Prague. The killer had strangled her with his hands in what appeared to be a piece of clothing. 
Unlike many of the other murdered women, Bakova was not a sex worker. It's suspected that the killer offered Bakova a ride home and instead took her to the woods where he killed her. The police found evidence that Jack was at Prague around the time of the murder. In May 1992, the investigators made a shocking discovery. Jack had always claimed that his aunt, Anna Unterweger, was a sex worker who was murdered in 1967. The investigators found out that a sex worker named Anna Unterweger was killed in 1967, but she was not Jack's aunt. Anna and Jack were not related, they just shared the same last name. It's believed that Jack just read about the murder in the newspaper. Also, there was no evidence that Jack's mother was a sex worker. The investigators suspected that Jack said his mother and aunt were sex workers who add to the mythology of his life. Jack Underbeger's trial started on April 20th, 1994 in Vienna. Since Jack could be tried for murders that he was suspected of committing in different countries, he was facing 11 counts of murder. This includes the murder that happened in September 1990 in Prague, the seven murders that happened in Austria between October 1990 and April 1991, and the three homicides that occurred in Los Angeles in June and July 1991. One murder he was not charged with was the 1974 murder of Marika Horvath. Jack's trial was billed as the trial of the century for several reasons. The first was that Jack was a celebrity. Also, the Austrian government had given him grants so he could produce plays and write books. While Jack was touring with his plays and being funded by the government, it is suspected that he killed three women. Jack had also been the poster boy for prison reform. The Austrian government was deeply embarrassed over the situation. And finally, Jack's trial was considered the trial of the century because serial killers are rare in Austria. No one in modern Austria had ever faced 11 charges of murder. The prosecution had a lot of evidence, but much of it was circumstantial. Their main argument was that all 11 murders shared a lot of similarities. This suggested that one person committed all of them. The prosecution argued that if they could connect Jack to one of the murders, then the jury should logically be able to find him guilty of all 11 murders. So the prosecution spent a lot of time explaining the similarities between the murders. They noted that many of the victims were sex workers. The victims were driven out to the woods where they were sexually assaulted and strangled with their own clothing, usually a piece of undergarment. Many times the piece of clothing was tied around the victim's neck and it was left there. An expert testified that the knots were all tied the same. Jack's touring schedule, credit card statements, and receipts that were found in his possession were used to show that he was in the different cities around the times of the murders. There were also dated photos of him in the cities where the murders were committed. Also, Jack did not have alibis for any of the nights of the murders. Statistics were also introduced as evidence. In the years before Jack was released from prison, an average of 1.5 sex workers were murdered every year in Austria. After Jack was paroled, within seven months, seven sex workers were murdered. He also happened to be in Prague and Los Angeles when very similar murders were committed. The prosecution said that there was no way this could be a series of coincidences. The most damning piece of evidence was a strand of hair that was found in Jack's car. DNA testing was done and an expert said he was 99.99% sure that the hair belonged to Blanca Bakova. On the second last day of the trial, there was an explosion at the courthouse. 
Someone had detonated a bomb made with a high-grade military explosive. No one was hurt. The courtroom was on damage, so the trial continued. It's not known if the bombing was connected to the trial. The bomber has never been identified. Jack Underveger's trial lasted for 30 days. Then the jury deliberated for nine hours. In Austria, the jury does not have to unanimously agree to reach a verdict. Instead, verdicts are decided by the majority. On nine of the 11 counts of murder, six voted to convict and two voted to acquit. The other four jurors were undecided. On the last two counts of murder, five people were undecided. There were the two cases where only skeletal remains were found. Because of the state of the remains, the medical examiner could not determine if there really had been a homicide, and this is why less jurors voted to convict. Jack was sentenced to life in prison on June 29, 1994. Hours later, 42-year-old Jack Unterweger was found hanging from a shower curtain rod in his cell. He had made a noose with a thin metal wire and the drawstrings from his sweatpants. Jack Unterweger, the suspected killer of at least 13 women, was pronounced dead in his jail cell. Number 3. Merlin Santana Merlin Santana was born in March 1976 in New York City to Dominican parents. When he was three years old, Santana's parents got him involved in the performing arts in the hopes that he would stay away from the street life. Santana got a break into show business in 1991 when he was cast in several TV shows and a movie. That year, he had two guest spots on the CBS sitcom Major Dad. This was followed by a small role in the first season of Law & Order. He also had a small role in an art house movie starring Joe Cusack. His biggest role was Stanley on The Cosby Show. Stanley was a boyfriend of the youngest Cosby children, Rudy. Santana appeared in seven episodes of The Cosby Show over two seasons. Santana then landed a leading role on the ABC sitcom Getting By, which was part of the TGIF lineup. Getting By lasted for two seasons. Santana then got two major roles on two dramas, Under One Roof and Street Gear, but both were cancelled after one season. In 1996, Merlin Santana landed the role that he would be known best for. It was Romeo Santana on the WB's The Steve Harvey Show. The Steve Harvey Show ran for six seasons and Santana is credited with appearing in all 122 episodes. The show came to an end in 2002 with a final season of 13 episodes. In the early morning hours of November 9th, 2002, Santana was at an acquaintance's home in the Crenshaw District of Los Angeles. He was there with a 15-year-old girl whom he had recently met, Monique King. Around 2.45 a.m., Santana left the home and he was sitting in the passenger seat of a car that was being driven by his friend and fellow actor, Brandon Adams. Adams had appeared in films like The Sandlot, The Mighty Ducks, and its sequel, D2. As they were sitting in the car, at least one man approached the car. Then a gunshot rang out and shattered the quiet of the night. The bullet went through the trunk of the car, through the headrest of the passenger seat, and entered 26-year-old Merlin Santana's head. Adams immediately sped off towards the hospital. At an intersection, he came across a police car and he flagged the officer down. Santana was rushed to the hospital, but it was too late to save the up-and-coming actor. The police talked to the people that Santana hung out with that night. This included Monique King. 
She told the police what happened that morning. King had told her friends, 20-year-old Damien Andre Gates and 23-year-old Brandon Douglas Bynes, that Santana had tried to rape her. However, this was a lie. Santana had not acted inappropriately towards her. Gates, Bynes, and another teenage girl showed up in their own vehicle. Gates was the one who fired the deadly shot. On November 21st, less than two weeks after the murder, both Gates and Bynes were arrested. In January 2004, Bynes pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter and he was sentenced to 23 years of prison. A month later, Gates was convicted of first degree murder and he was sentenced to 25 years to life. In March of that year, King, who was 17, was convicted of second degree murder. She was ordered to stay in prison until she was 25 years old. There is no record of what happened to King after she was sentenced, so it's assumed she was released at the age of 25 and she has stayed out of the news since. A search of the inmate database shows no record of Brandon Bynes being incarcerated, so he was either paroled or he died in prison. 39-year-old Damian Gates is currently incarcerated at the Correctional Training Facility in Soldag, California. He'll be able to apply for parole in 2026. Number 2. Susan Cabot Harriet Shapiro was born in Boston, Massachusetts in July 1927 to Jewish parents. Her childhood was a rough one. Her father abandoned her and her mother when she was young. Then her mother was committed to a psychiatric hospital. She ended up growing up in eight different foster homes where she suffered horrible abuse. When she was in her teens, she got involved in acting. In July 1944, she got married to a childhood friend. It's believed that she got married as a way to escape her foster home. In 1946, she started performing in a nightclub in Manhattan under the name Susan Cabot. A year later, Cabot had an uncredited role in the classic film noir, Kiss of Death. Cabot then found work doing commercials. In 1949, she was discovered by a casting agent. Cabot was then cast as the co-star in the adventure film On the Isle of Samoa, which was released in 1950. After that, she signed a deal with Universal Pictures. She ended up making six films with Universal. In 1954, she left Universal and started doing stage plays in New York City. She returned to the world of film in 1957. The movie Carnival Rock was a low-budget indie movie directed by the legendary filmmaker Roger Corman. This was the start of Cabot's career as a low-budget B-movie actress, which included films like Fort Massacre, Machine Gun Kelly, and The Wasp Woman. In 1959, Susan Cabot made headlines, and it wasn't for her acting. Cabot had a highly publicized affair with King Hussein, who was the king of the country of Jordan. Cabot, who was 36, met King Hussein, age 24, when he came to Los Angeles for a visit. Around the same time of the affair, Cabot stopped acting. In January 1964, Cabot gave birth to a son, Timothy Scott. Timothy was born a dwarf. Cabot never publicly revealed the identity of Timothy's father. In 1968, Cabot married a man named Michael Roman. Timothy took on his stepfather's last name. Susan Cabot and Michael Roman stayed married until 1983 and then they divorced. Susan Cabot apparently made money through real estate transactions and by restoring and selling classic cars.
Cabot was in psychotherapy for most of her adult life. She had frequent mental breakdowns. One of her doctors said that she suffered from what is today known as post-traumatic stress disorder because of her awful childhood. Cabot continued to live with her son, Timothy, in Encino, California. Over the years, their house fell into disrepair and the mother and son filled it with trash. At some point, Cabot stopped leaving the house and she became a recluse. On December 10, 1986, Cabot's 22-year-old son, Timothy, called the police. When the police arrived, they were shocked by the state of the house. There was garbage and rotting food everywhere. Timothy explained to the officers that he had gone to bed at around 9.30 p.m., but got up about half an hour later because he was hungry. He said that he went into the kitchen and he encountered a Hispanic man wearing a ninja mask. He said that the man stabbed him in the arm and struck him on the head with a blunt object. Timothy claimed that he was knocked unconscious and he came to about half an hour later. That's when he called the police. The police noted he had a small bump on his head and there was a cut on his arm but it was only a quarter inch long and it wasn't deep. Timothy told the police he lived with his mother, but he had not checked on her. The officers went to the master bedroom, and they found 59-year-old Susan Cabot dead in her blood-drenched bed. It was clear she had been beaten to death. Timothy gave the police permission to search the house. But the police had problems getting into Timothy's bedroom because he had two large Akitas, which is a dog breed similar to German Shepherds, and they wouldn't allow anyone into the room. One of the detectives called the dogs vicious. Two different teams of animal control specialists were called to get the dogs out. The police looked around Timothy's room and they found a clothes hamper with a box of laundry detergent in it. In the box of detergent, they found a weightlifting bar. It was determined to be the blunt object that was used to be cabined to death. The police quickly surmised that there was no man in a ninja mask and Timothy killed his mother. They thought this for several reasons. The first was that Timothy did have some injuries, but they were very minor. Secondly, the murder weapon was found in Timothy's room, which had two vicious dogs in it. Had anyone else entered the room, the dogs would have mauled them. So Timothy was arrested and charged with first degree murder. In April 1987, a few months after Timothy Roman was arrested, it was revealed that the relationship between his mother, Susan Cabot, and King Hussein had lasted for years. Also, for decades, Cabot had received $1,500 a month from the King. Timothy's lawyer said that King Hussein may have been Timothy's father and the money could have been child support payments. Since Timothy might have been King Hussein's son, his lawyer wanted to move out of the jail because Timothy's heritage was Jewish. This is a problem because King Hussein is a direct descendant of the Prophet Muhammad. Timothy's lawyer argued that Timothy being a half Jewish and half Arab descendant of Muhammad may have made him a target for murder. But Timothy was not harmed in jail while he was awaiting trial. Timothy Roman went to trial for the murder of his mother in October 1989, about two and a half years after the murder. He elected to be tried by a judge and not a jury. Timothy's lawyer presented evidence that Timothy had been given a dangerous hormone from 1970 to 1985 to help him grow. Had Timothy not taken the hormone, he would have probably been about four feet tall. But since he had been given the hormone, he was about 5'3". The hormone was eventually taken off the market because some of them contained the virus that causes creutzfeldt jakob disease. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is a brain disease that leads to dementia 
and eventually death. Besides the hormones, Timothy had been given other drugs to help him grow. He had also been on a variety of drugs for most of his life for his behavioral problems. His mother's mental health also had a tremendous impact on him. When Timothy was 11, a pediatrician said that he was an emotionally immature, somewhat disturbed child who was having difficulty handling the demands of growing up. The hormones, the drugs, and poor mental health created a perfect storm that made him not responsible for his actions. Timothy testified on his own behalf. He said that on the night his mother died, she was having a mental breakdown. She was calling out for her mother. Timothy said that his mother didn't recognize him and she attacked him with a weightlifting bar and a scalpel. But he managed to wrestle the objects away from her. Timothy said he didn't remember killing his mother. He also admitted he lied to the police. He did not think that anyone would believe him if he said his mother attacked him. In the closing argument, the prosecutor asked the judge to find Timothy guilty of voluntary manslaughter and not murder. He wanted him found guilty of voluntary manslaughter because he didn't see any evidence of premeditation. The trial had lasted six days. The judge took ten minutes to reach a verdict. He found Timothy Roman guilty of involuntary manslaughter. He was sentenced to three years of probation. Timothy had already spent two and a half years in prison awaiting trial, so he was released after he was convicted. Timothy Roman died in January 2002 at the age of 38. Supposedly, his death was from complication of Creutzfeldt Jakob disease which is the disorder that was caused by the hormones that he was given to help his growth. There was another odd twist in the story 16 years after Timothy's death. In 2008, more files were released regarding the assassination of US President John F. Kennedy. Susan Cabot was not involved in the 1963 assassination in any way, but several fascinating pieces of information came out regarding her relationship with King Hussein. Cabot and King Hussein met at a party hosted by an oil man and it's believed that the CIA arranged the meeting between the two. They arranged for them to meet to keep King Hussein happy and to ensure he would continue to cooperate with the United States. It has never been confirmed that King Hussein was the father of Timothy Roman but many people believe that he was. King Hussein died in 1999. Number 1. Phil Hartman Philip Edward Hartman was born in September 1948 in Brantford, Ontario, Canada. He was the fourth child and his parents would go on to have four more. In March 1957, when Phil was eight, the Hartman family moved to Monmouth, Maine. But they didn't stay there long. The family moved around the United States for several years. They eventually ended up in Westchester, which is a Los Angeles suburb. After high school, Phil attended college for a short time. But then he dropped out to be a roadie for a band. In 1972, he returned to school and studied graphic arts at the California State University, Northridge. After graduating, he started his own graphic arts business that designed album covers for bands like Crosby, Stills and Nash in America. In 1975, Phil Hartman joined the Groundlings Comedy Troupe, which was founded a year earlier. The Groundlings would go on to have many famous alumni, including Will Ferrell, Melissa McCarthy, and Lisa Kudrow. During his time with the Groundlings, Phil met Paul Rubens. Together, they developed the character Pee Wee Herman, which was portrayed by Rubens. 
1978, Phil had a small role in the mockumentary Stunt Rock. The following year, he made his first television appearance. He was a contestant on the dating show. He won, but supposedly the woman who chose him never showed up for the date. In 1980, Paul Rubens created the Pee Wee Herman show, which was a stage play. Phil had a supporting role playing Captain Carl, a gruff sailor. In 1981, HBO recorded a performance of the play and aired it as a special. During the 1980s, Phil Hartman continued to get minor roles on television shows and in movies. He also started doing voice work on animated shows including Scooby-Doo and Scrappy-Doo and The Dukes. In 1985, he co-wrote the screenplay for Pee-Wee's Big Adventure, which was directed by Tim Burton. It was Burton's directorial debut. Phil had a small role as a reporter in the film. In 1986, CBS started broadcasting the children's show, Pee Wee's Playhouse. Herman appeared in several episodes of the first season as Captain Carl. Phil Herman's big break came in 1986 when he was chosen to be a cast member on Saturday Night Live. He developed and portrayed some memorable characters like Eugene, the anal retentive chef, and unfrozen caveman lawyer. He also did several notable impressions like Frank Sinatra, Barbara Bush, and Bill Clinton. During his time at Saturday Night Live, Phil developed a persona that he became best known for. It's what the New Yorker called a pompous blowhard. In 1986, Phil went on a blind date with a model and aspiring actress named Bryn Omdahl. In November 1987, Phil and Bryn were wed. Phil had been married twice before, but the marriages only lasted a few years. In 1989, Bryn gave birth to a son, Sean. This was followed by a daughter a year later, Bergen. In the second half of the 1980s, Phil continued to do voice work in animated series. This included Dennis the Menace. Phil did the voices of Henry Mitchell, the father of Dennis, and George Wilson, the neighbor of the titular character. In 1991, Phil Hartman voiced the character Lionel Hutz on the second season of The Simpsons. It was supposed to be a one-time appearance but more parts were written for Phil. He continued to provide the voice for Lionel Hutz, a down-on-his-luck lawyer, and Troy McClure, a faded movie star, who often introduced himself by saying, Hi, I'm Troy McClure. You might remember me from... Phil was loved by the writers and the producers of The Simpsons. He was also adored by the fans of The Simpsons. Phil also immensely enjoyed voicing Troy McClure. He once said, It's the one thing I do in my life that's almost an avocation. I do it for the pure love of it. In 1994, Phil Hartman left Saturday Night Live after eight seasons. That year, he got his first lead role in a movie. He starred in Houseguest alongside comedian Sinbad. The film was a moderate success. Phil was also cast in the show, News Radio, alongside Dave Foley, Stephen Root, Andy Dick, and Joe Rogan. The show was a critical hit, but never found much mainstream success. But, in the spring of 1998, it was renewed for a fourth season. So while Phil Hartman's career was going well, his home life was rather rough. His wife, Bryn, struggled with drug and alcohol addictions. Phil grew emotionally distant in the relationship, and he would often avoid fights by pretending he was asleep. Friends of Phil said that he wanted to leave Bryn, but he loved his children and didn't want to break up the family. He also did not want to get divorced for the third time. 
On the night of May 27th, 1998, Rin went out for dinner with a friend. Nothing seemed to be out of sorts, and her friend noticed nothing unusual. After dinner, Bryn stopped by another friend's house and drank a few beers. She then returned to her family's home in Encino at around 1 a.m. It's suspected that Phil and Bryn argued and then Phil went to bed. Bryn drank some more alcohol and possibly did some cocaine. Then Bryn grabbed a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson handgun out of a lockbox. She then shot her husband, 49-year-old Phil Hartman, in the neck and the chest from about a foot and a half away. She then shot her husband of 10 years from point-blank range in the face. After murdering her husband, Bryn drove to a friend's home. He immediately noticed that she was very intoxicated. Bryn told her friend that she had killed Phil, but he did not believe her. He assumed that they just had a fight. But then the gun fell out of her purse. He looked at the gun and thought it was loaded with six bullets, so he didn't think that she had fired any shots. Bryn spent about three hours at his home and then said she felt sober enough to drive. But she wanted her friend to follow her home. Bryn's friend agreed. When Bryn and her friend arrived at the Hartman home, he followed her inside. He saw Phil's dead body in the bed in the master bedroom. Bryn's friend went to another room and called 911. Bryn then locked herself in the master bedroom with Phil's dead body. The police rushed to the scene. The police got Bryn's friend and nine-year-old Sean Hartman out of the house. Then a single gunshot rang out. 40-year-old Bryn Hartman had shot herself in the head. It was a different gun that she used to murder her husband. Bryn's body was found on the bed next to Phil's body. The police found the couple's daughter, six-year-old Bergen, unharmed in her bedroom. After the shocking tragedy, Bryn's brother, who was the executor of the estate, sued the pharmaceutical company, Pfizer. He claimed that Bryn's use of their drug, Zoloft, led to the murder-suicide. Pfizer settled out of court and gave the Hartman children a monetary settlement. Bryn's sister and her husband raised Sean and Bergen. They grew up in Wisconsin and Minnesota. At the time of this video, Sean is 31 years old and Bergen is 28 years old. Their family said that both of them are thriving. Number 3. Dorothy Stratton Dorothy Ruth Hogg Stratton was born in February 1960 in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. She grew up in Coquitlam, which is a city about 18 miles from downtown Vancouver. In early 1978, Dorothy was working at a Dairy Queen in Coquitlam. One day, a 26-year-old man named Paul Snyder came into the Dairy Queen. He worked as a promoter for car and cycling shows. But Snyder liked the finer things in life. He drove a black Corvette and he wore tailored suits and expensive jewelry. To supplement his income, Snyder worked as a pimp. When Snyder saw Dorothy, he saw something special. He got her phone number and they started dating. Dorothy liked Snyder because he was an older man who showered her with gifts. Dorothy's father had left her family when she was young and they never had much money. Snyder convinced Dorothy to let him take some nude photos of her and send them to Playboy. She agreed and in the summer of 1980 he sent the photos of 18 year old Dorothy to Playboy. The editor of Playboy who got the photos was immediately impressed and asked Dorothy to fly out to Los Angeles, California for a test shoot. Dorothy ended up moving to Los Angeles in August 1978. 
She participated in the 25th anniversary Great Playmate Hunt and she was named a finalist. In October 1978, Paul Snyder moved to Los Angeles to be with Dorothy. They got married in June 1979 in Las Vegas, Nevada. The problem was that neither Dorothy nor Snyder had a green card, so neither of them could work legally in the United States. Hugh Hefner, the founder of Playboy, pulled some strings and got Dorothy a temporary work visa. In August 1979, Dorothy, who was now using the last name Stratton, was named Playmate of the Month. She also started working as a bunny at the Playboy Club in Century City. While working at the club, she became part of a different social circle and she met several influential people. It led to her being cast in several movies and TV shows. Her first role was an uncredited role in the comedy Americathon, which starred John Ritter and Fred Willard. This was followed by a small role in the roller disco comedy Skate Town USA. She had guest roles on two popular television shows, Fantasy Island and Buck Rogers in the 25th century. She finished out 1979 by starring in a movie. It was an exploitation movie called Autumn Born. In 1980, Dorothy was chosen to be Playmate of the Year. She was the first Canadian to receive the title. For the first two months of 1980, she did photo shoots for the spread for Playmate of the Year. Also during that time, she made a low-budget sci-fi comedy, Galaxina. Dorothy starred in the film as the titular character. Since Paul Snyder still didn't have a green card or work permit, Dorothy supported them both financially. Even though they relied entirely on Dorothy's income, Snyder tried to control everything. He was in charge of the money, he chose where they lived, and he drove her around. He even told her who she should sleep with to advance her career. None of Dorothy's friends liked Snyder and they encouraged her to leave him. Hugh Hefner told her that he had a pimp quality about him. In March 1980, Dorothy traveled to New York City because she had been cast in the movie They All Laughed, which was starring John Ritter and Audrey Hepburn. The film was being directed by Pierre Bogdanovich from his own script. It was Dorothy's first credited role in a big budget movie. During the production of the film, Dorothy and Bogdanovich started having an affair. In April 1980, it was officially announced that Dorothy was Playmate of the Year. After the announcement was made, she appeared on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. In June 1980, Dorothy broke off her relationship with Snyder. Snyder was furious. Without her, he did not have an income. He drained their joint bank account and sold anything he could get his hands on. This included a 1980 Jaguar XJS that Dorothy was given when she was named Playmate of the Year. Snyder used some of the money to pay a private detective to follow Dorothy. Snyder thought she might be having an affair, so he asked the private detective to investigate this. After the movie was finished shooting in New York, Dorothy traveled back to Los Angeles with Bogdanovich and she moved into his mansion. By early August 1980, Paul Snyder knew that Dorothy was involved in a romantic relationship with Bogdanovich. On August 14, 1980, Dorothy went over to the home she formerly shared with Snyder and two roommates. It's believed she went there to discuss a monetary settlement for ending their marriage. When she got to the home, the roommates were away. The roommates returned home that evening and saw both Snyder and Dorothy's cars in the driveway. 
their roommates watch TV for several hours and they noticed it was awfully quiet in the couple's former bedroom. So one of them went to check on them and they made a horrifying discovery. They said that the bedroom was something straight out of a horror movie. They called the police immediately. The police were later able to piece together what happened. The night before, Paul Snyder had purchased a 12-gauge shotgun from a private seller he found in the classified ads. When Dorothy came over, he raped her and then shot her in the face with a shotgun. After she was dead, he sexually abused her body. About an hour after he killed her, he shot himself in the head with the same shotgun. Dorothy Stratton was 20 years old and Paul Snyder was 29 years old. The murder-suicide was big news in North America. Many people considered it to be a tragic loss because they thought that Dorothy Starr was rising. Several critics said she had great natural comedic timing and she could have been a great comedic actor. After the murder, the last film that Dorothy starred in, They All Laughed, was released in several test markets. But the film performed poorly, so the studio decided not to do a wide release. Writer and director Peter Bogdanovich was disappointed that the movie wouldn't reach a national audience and he wanted to preserve the memory of his former lover. So he purchased the film rights for North America for $5 million and then paid for its distribution. Unfortunately, he only saw a return of about $1 million. He ended up filing for bankruptcy in 1985 and he lost the mansion where he had briefly lived with Dorothy. Dorothy's short career as a model and an actress and her murder were the basis for two movies. One was the 1981 NBC made-for-TV movie, Death of a Centerfold. Jamie Lee Curtis played Dorothy and Bruce Weitz played Snyder. In 1983, the story was again made into a movie. The film, Star 80, was directed by acclaimed director Bob Fosse and it starred Muriel Hemingway as Dorothy and Snyder was played by Eric Roberts. Several songs have also been written about Dorothy. This includes The Best Was Yet To Come by Canadian rocker Brian Adams. Adams also co-wrote the song Cover Girl, which was performed by the Canadian rock band Prism. British alternative rock band Bush has a song about Dorothy called Dead Meat, which is on their 1999 album The Science of Things. In 1984, Peter Bogdanovich published a book entitled The Killing of the Unicorn. It was a biography of Dorothy and a memoir of his time with her. In the book, Bogdanovich blames Dorothy's murder on Hugh Hefner and the Playboy culture. He also claims that Hefner made sexual advances on Dorothy. In 1985, Hugh Hefner was interviewed by Geraldo Rivera. He denied making advances on Dorothy. He said that the blame for her murder lies at the feet of Bogdanovich. He said that their affair led to the downfall of Dorothy and Snyder's marriage. In December 1988, 49-year-old Pierre Bogdanovich married Dorothy's 20-year-old sister, Louise. They were married for 13 years and divorced in 2001. Number 2. Ramon Navarro Jose Ramon Gil Seminego was born in February 1899 in Durango, Mexico. His father was a wealthy dentist. As a child, Jose learned to play the piano and he was a naturally good singer. He was also a skilled actor. As he grew into his teens, people noticed his striking good looks. In November 1910, the Mexican Revolution broke out, throwing the country into turmoil. 
In November 1915, 16-year-old Jose and his brother set out for Los Angeles, California. They arrived there on Thanksgiving 1915. When they arrived there, they found work being ushers at a theater and being busboys at restaurants. Not long after arriving in Los Angeles, Jose began looking for work as extras in films. His first role was in 1916's Joan the Woman, directed by the legendary Cecil B. DeMille. He had a small role as a starving peasant. In 1917 and 1918, he had minor, uncredited roles in five movies. In 1919, Jose moved to New York City, New York, to perform in stage plays. One play was successful, and it toured around the country. Jose returned to Los Angeles and the world of film in 1921. That year, he had four uncredited roles. In 1922, he got his first screen credit with a small role in the film, Mr. Barnes of New York. His character dies in a duel early in the film. Next, he appeared in the 1922 film, The Prisoner of Senda. The movie was a success and it proved to be Jose's launch pad to stardom. For his next film, where he was one of the leads, Jose used a new stage name that was given to him by the studio, Ramon Navarro. In 1923, Ramon was cast in the lead role of Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ. The film was a massive production and it went on to become the most expensive movie produced in the silent era. The film's final cost was $3.9 million, which is about $61 million in 2021. The film was a massive success, and it was MGM's highest grossing movie. It would hold that record for 25 years. The film made Ramon Navarro one of the biggest movie stars in the world. In August 1926, movie star Rudolph Valentino died at the age of 31. Valentino had been billed as the Lion Lover. After Valentino's death, Ramon's movie studio started billing him as the Lion Lover. Ramon was considered a heartthrob and he received fan mail from thousands of women. However, Ramon was gay and he secretly dated several men. After Ben-Hur, Ramon became one of the highest paid actors in the world making over $100,000 per film. In 1929, Ramon starred in his first talking film, Devil May Care. Ramon continued to make films with MGM, but none of them were as successful as Ben-Hur. In 1935, MGM chose not to renew his contract. Over the next 30 years, Ramon Navarro sporadically acted in films and he had minor television roles. Sometime in the late 1960s, Ramon started using an escort service which provided him with male sex workers. On October 30th, 1968, Ramon got a call from a young man who said his name was Paul and he offered him a sexual encounter. Paul said his 17-year-old brother would be coming with him. Paul said that he got Ramon's phone number from another sex worker named Larry Ortega. Ramon accepted the offer and told Paul to come over that evening. The next morning, Ramon's personal secretary arrived at Ramon's home in Laurel Canyon. He immediately noticed that the house had been ransacked. His secretary searched the house. In the bed, in the master bedroom, he found the dead body of 69-year-old Ramon Navarro. His wrists were bound behind his back. Under his body, written on the bedsheet and ballpoint pen, was the name Larry. Ramon had a ballpoint pen in his hand. The medical examiner determined that Ramon had been tied up and beaten with a walking cane. He had also been punched and kicked several times. None of the blows were fatal, but when Ramon was left bound and unconscious, 
He drowned on his own blood. The police learned that Ramon had used the services of sex worker Larry Ortega. The police talked to Ortega and he said that Ramon had called him to see if he gave his number to a guy named Paul who had a brother named Tom. Ortega then told the police he had a 22-year-old brother-in-law named Paul Ferguson. Paul had a 17-year-old brother named Tom. The police also looked at Ramon's phone records. On the night of Ramon's murder, someone had made a 40-minute phone call to Chicago, Illinois. They called the number and it belonged to a young woman. She said that her boyfriend, Tom Ferguson, had called her that night. She said that while they talked, she heard Ramon yelling for help in the background. It turned out that the brothers both had criminal records and the police had their fingerprints on file. Their fingerprints were compared to fingerprints found at the crime scene. They were a match. The police tracked the brothers down and they were arrested on November 6, 1968, about a week after the murder. Paul and Tom Ferguson's trial started on July 28, 1969. The district attorney said that the brothers went to the house because they heard Ramon kept a large sum of cash in the house. They tied him up and tortured him, demanding to know where the money was hidden. They also ransacked the house looking for the money. But Ramon didn't keep much money in his house. The lawyer for the brothers argued that they should be found guilty of manslaughter and not first degree murder. For most of the trial, the brothers blamed each other for the murder. Then, late in the trial, Tom confessed to killing Ramon. He said that he beat up Ramon after Ramon came on to him sexually. He had never meant to kill him. He just hit him several times, breaking his nose, and then he accidentally suffocated. He wrote Larry on the bedsheet to cast suspicion away from them and on to Larry Ortega. The district attorney said that Tom confessed just to try to muddy the waters. They said that Tom was only taking the blame because he was 17 at the time of the murder and he wouldn't be sentenced to death like his brother would be. The trial lasted for two months and then the jury deliberated for two and a half hours. Paul and Tom Ferguson were both found guilty of first degree murder. In October 1969, they were sentenced to life in prison and the judge recommended that they never be paroled. But they were both paroled less than a decade into their life sentences. In 1975, while in prison, Paul confessed that he worked alone when he murdered Ramon Navarro. He said that his brother was just inside the house and he didn't join in on the beating. So in 1976, Tom was paroled on a work furlough. He had served less than eight years in prison. After Tom was paroled, he continued to get into trouble. In 1977, he was arrested for sexual assault and he was sent back to prison. In 1987, he was arrested for raping a 54-year-old woman. For that conviction, he served less than three years in prison. In March 2006, when Tom was in his mid-50s, he died by suicide by slitting his throat in a motel room. As for Paul, in 1975, he won a prestigious writing award from PEN America for a short story he wrote. He was the first prisoner ever to win the award. Paul was paroled in 1978 after serving less than 10 years for the murder of Ramon Navarro. In 1989, Paul was convicted of rape and sodomy in Missouri. He was sentenced to 60 years in prison. Paul Ferguson died in September 2018 while in prison. He was 72 years old.
Number one, Adrian Shelley. Adrian Levine was born in Queens, New York in June 1966. She had two brothers and they grew up on Long Island. Adrian had a strong interest in acting at a young age and she performed in several regional stage plays. After graduating high school, Adrian went to Boston University to study film production. She ended up dropping out in her third year. She then moved to Manhattan and looked for acting work. She took on the stage surname Shelley in honor of her father, Sheldon. In 1989, Adrian Shelley was cast as one of the lead roles in the indie dramedy The Unbelievable Truth. It played at the Sundance Film Festival and was nominated for the Grand Jury Prize. Hal Hartley, the writer and the director of the film, liked working with Adrian. So he rewrote an old script he had to suit her. The film, entitled Trust, was released in 1990. Throughout the early 1990s, Adrian continued to get lead or supporting roles, mostly in indie comedies. Often, critics described her characters as quirky. In 1996, Adrian made the jump into writing and directing with her film, Sun Manhattan, which she also starred in. In 1999, she wrote, directed, and starred in another movie, I'll Take You There. Both movies that Adrian wrote, directed, and starred in received mixed reviews and made very little money. In addition to being in over a dozen movies in the 1990s, Adrian also starred in several off-Broadway plays. In 2000, Adrian had a guest spot on an episode of Law & Order where she played a former porn star. In December 2002, Adrian married Andy Ostroy, who was the CEO of a marketing firm. Adrian became pregnant, and while she was pregnant, she wrote a script for a movie called Waitress. Waitress is about a pregnant woman named Jenna who works as a waitress in a diner in a small town in the Deep South. She is married to an abusive man but finds a new love interest when a handsome doctor moves to town. In 2006, Waitress went into production with Adrian as its director. The movie's budget was $1.5 million, which isn't a tremendous amount for a major motion picture but it was the biggest budget Adrian had ever worked with. Waitress also had some major Hollywood stars, including Carrie Russell, Nathan Fillion, Cheryl Hines, Jeremy Sisto, and Andy Griffith. Unlike the other movies Adrian wrote and directed, she didn't have the lead role in Waitress. Instead, she has a supporting and memorable role as Dawn, one of the other waitresses at the diner. Tragically, Adrian would never see Waitress debut to audiences. Adrian had rented a studio apartment in Manhattan's West Village and she used it as an office. On November 1st, 2006, her husband dropped her off at her office at around 9.30 a.m. He became concerned when he didn't hear from her throughout the day. That afternoon, he went to the building that housed her office. He asked the doorman to come with him to his wife's office. Hanging from a bed sheet that was tied to the shower curtain rod was the dead body of 40 year old Adrian Shelley. An autopsy was performed and she had died from strangulation. Initially, her death was ruled a suicide. Adrian's husband, Andy Ostroy, and many of her friends and family were adamant she would not have killed herself. They said she was happy and adored her two and a half year old daughter. Plus, her career was at a high point and she was looking forward to the release of Waitress. So the police went back to the apartment and did some more investigating. On the lid of the toilet seat, close to where the body was hanging, they found a sneaker print made from dust. The police looked around the building 
they found out that several apartments were being renovated. One of the apartments that was being renovated was directly below Adrian's office. They discovered that the sneaker print came from the shoe of a 19-year-old construction worker named Diego Pilco. Pilco lived in the basement of the building. He was arrested and questioned. Pilko told the police he was working on the apartment below Adrian's office. She came down and complained about the noise. Pilko said that he became annoyed and he threw a hammer at her. He missed and Adrian stormed off. Pilko followed her and begged her not to report him. He was an undocumented immigrant from Ecuador and he didn't want any problems that might get him deported. He said that he grabbed her in the doorway of her office. He said she slapped him so he punched her in the face. She fell to the ground and hit her head. Pilgo said that he thought he had killed her. So he grabbed the bed sheet and hung her from the shower curtain rod to make it look like a suicide. He didn't know that when he hung her, he killed her. Pilko was charged with her murder, but there were many problems with the story. Mainly, Adrian didn't have any head injuries. In February 2008, Diego Pilko pleaded guilty to first degree manslaughter. At his hearing, he told a news story about what happened on the day Adrian was killed. He said that he was able to sneak into Adrian's apartment. He was trying to steal money from her purse and she caught him. He grabbed her and then strangled her to death. He then hung her to make it look like a suicide. A month after he pleaded guilty, Diego Pilco was sentenced to 25 years of prison without the chance of parole. At the time of this video, 34-year-old Diego Pilco is serving a sentence at the Coxsackie Correctional Facility in Coxsackie, New York. He's expected to be released in April 2028. He'll most likely be deported after he serves his sentence. Waitress debuted at the Sundance Film Festival in January 2008, just a few months after Adrian's murder. The film rights were purchased by Fox Searchlight Pictures and it had a limited theatrical run. According to Box Office Mojo, it generated $22 million at the worldwide box office, making it the highest grossing movie Adrian had ever been involved in. Waitress was also a hit with the critics. Many critics thought that Waitress showed that Adrian Shelley had a bright future as a writer, director, and an actor. Waitress was adapted into a stage musical and it debuted on Broadway in April 2016. It played on Broadway until 2020. A revival is planned when Broadway reopens in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Number 3. Barbara Colby Barbara Colby was born in New York City in July 1939 and she grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana. Colby started acting after high school. Her first major role was in the play Six Characters in Search of an Author in 1964. The following year she made her Broadway debut appearance in The Devils. She continued to perform in Broadway plays for the next three years. In 1967, she had a small, uncredited role in the film The Tiger Makes Out. Another uncredited role followed this in Richard Lester's movie, Petulia. In 1968, Colby joined the America Conservatory Theater in San Francisco, California. She was the theater's leading actress for two years. That same year, she married Robert Daniels Levitt Jr. Levitt was the son of famed actress and singer Ethel Merman. 
Colby had her first credited role on television in 1969 on a two-part episode of the police procedural NYPD. In 1970, she relocated to Los Angeles, California, where she continued to act on stage. But she was hoping to break into television or film. Los Angeles Times did a full story about Colby in what she has called a new breed of professional actress. In 1971, Colby landed a role in the popular crime drama, Columbo. This was the start of a string of guest spots on some of the most popular TV shows of the 1970s, including The Odd Couple, McMillan and Wife, Kung Fu, and Gunsmoke. Then, in 1974, Colby got her big break. She was cast in the Mary Tyler Moore show as a streetwise sex worker named Sherry. In the episode, Moore's character, Mary, spends a night in jail with Sherry. The producers were impressed with Colby, so they brought her character back the following season. The Mary Tyler Moore show was incredibly popular, and it spawned the spin-off, Rhoda. The producers decided to develop another spin-off based on Mary's former landlord, Phyllis, played by Cloris Leachman. In Phyllis, the titular character moves back to her hometown, San Francisco, California, with her daughter. In San Francisco, Phyllis gets a job at a photography studio run by Julie Erskine. The producers of the show decide to cast Barbara Colby as Julie. It was finally Colby's big break into the world of television. Unfortunately, while Colby's professional life was going well, her personal life was not. She and her husband were separated. However, Colby remained close to her mother-in-law, Ethel Merman. On July 24, 1975, Colby taught an acting class in West Los Angeles. After class, close to midnight, Colby was walking to her car with one of her students, 35-year-old James Kiernan. Kiernan had recently filmed a guest spot for the other Mary Tyler Moore spin-off, Rhoda. Suddenly, two gunshots rang out. Barbara Colby was shot in the shoulder and James Kiernan was shot in the chest with a 22 caliber handgun. 36-year-old Barbara Colby died at the scene. Kiernan was rushed to the hospital. He told the police that they were shot by two men who were black and in their early 20s and they were driving a light-colored van. Unfortunately, 35-year-old James Kiernan died at the hospital. The police were baffled by the crime. There was no attempt to rob Colby and Kiernan. The gunmen didn't threaten them or even say anything before they shot them. What was odd was that it was not the only violent incident that happened in West Los Angeles that night. Within 40 minutes, there were two other violent crimes. Roland and Gloria Witt were out for dinner with another couple. Roland Witt was an aerospace executive with Lockheed Aircraft Company. Three masked men jumped out of the bushes when they arrived at the other couple's home. They were ordered to lie face down on the lawn. Encouraged by her husband, Gloria Witt ran. One of the men was armed with a shotgun. He fired seven or eight times at Gloria as she ran, and she was hit twice. 57-year-old Gloria Witt died as a result of her wounds. In another incident, two couples returned to one of their homes when five men in masks approached them and forced them into their home. They stole some cash and jewelry and ransacked the home. The two couples were left unharmed. The police arrested six men in the hours after the three attacks, but they were later released. About a month later, five of the men were arrested for two of the attacks that happened that night. They said they were driving around looking for people driving expensive cars. Then they followed them home, expecting to rob them. However, they claimed they had nothing to do with the murders of Barbara Colby and James Kiernan. 
The police also saw that the murders of the actors didn't fit the profiles of the other two attacks. The motive behind the others was robbery, and there was no attempt to rob Colby and Kiernan. Their murders were completely unprovoked. Plus, they were shot by two men in a light-colored van. The other attacks involved five men in a car. So the police ruled out the five men and the murders of Colby and Kiernan. The police concluded that Colby and Kiernan were victims of a random drive-by shooting. When Colby was killed, she had recorded three episodes of Phyllis. The producers considered canceling the show, but ultimately decided against it. Instead, Colby's character was recast and Liz Torres got the role. Phyllis lasted for two seasons before CBS canceled it. It's been over 47 years since the two actors were killed. The police have no promising clues in the case and it's doubtful the case will be solved unless someone comes forward with information. Number 2. Jack Nance Melvin John Nance, who went by Jack, was born in Boston, Massachusetts in December 1943. He grew up in Dallas, Texas. He started acting as a child and traveled around the United States performing in children's theaters. He performed with the American Conservatory Theater in San Francisco for eight years. In the mid-1960s, he was one of the finalists for the role of Ben Braddock in The Graduate. The filmmakers ended up going with Dustin Hoffman, which was his big break. The Graduate was nominated for seven Academy Awards, including a Best Actor nomination for Hoffman. Around the same time, Nance also got the role of Perry Smith in the adaptation of Truman Capote's true crime classic, In Cold Blood but he lost the role to Robert Blake. In 1968, Nance married Catherine E. Coulson. In the early 1970s, Nance landed his first two movie roles. The first was a bit part in the 1970 film Fools, and this was followed by a small role in 1971's Jump, also known as Fury on Wheels. In 1972, Jack Nance was living in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and he auditioned for a student film. After the audition, the director of the film walked Nance out to his car. They came across a Volkswagen with a homemade wooden roof rack. Nance said that he was impressed with the woodwork. The director told him he owned the car he had made the roof rack. Nance and the director talked for a while, and as they spoke, the director knew he had found his lead actor. The director's name was David Lynch, and he was casting the role of Henry Spencer in his film Eraserhead. Eraserhead was only supposed to be 20 minutes long, and it would take six weeks to shoot. But then it evolved into a feature-length film. Lynch ended up filming the movie in pieces over the next five years. After the film was released in March 1977, its popularity grew slowly. The film eventually found an audience in the midnight movie circuit and became a cult hit. It also established Lynch as a writer-director and led to his next project, The Elephant Man. Lynch wanted to cast Nance in the lead role, but it did not work out. Instead, John Hur was cast as Jack Merrick. Both Lynch and her were nominated for Academy Awards for their work on The Elephant Man. The Elephant Man was one of the few projects directed by Lynch that didn't include Nance. Nance had small roles in many of Lynch's most famous movies, including Dune, Blue Velvet, and Lost Highway. He also had small roles in other films not directed by Lynch, including Ghoulies, The Hotspot, and Meatballs 4. In 1976, Nance and his wife, Catherine E. Coulson, divorced. Throughout his adult life, Nance suffered from alcoholism. In 1986, while shooting Blue Velvet, Nance sought the help of Dennis Hopper. 
Hopper had just gone clean himself. Dan said he would jump out of his hotel window if Hopper didn't help him. So Hopper got him into a rehabilitation center in Los Angeles. At the rehab center, Nance met Kelly Jean Van Dyke. Kelly was the daughter of actor-comedian Jerry Van Dyke and the niece of Dick Van Dyke. Kelly had her own problems with drugs and alcohol and she was trying to get out of the porn industry. In 1990, Jack Nance's life seemed to be going well. He had a memorable role in Lynch's surprise hit television show, Twin Peaks. He plays a logger who finds the dead body of homecoming queen, Laura Palmer. In May 1991, Nance and Kelly Van Dyke were married. But not long after the wedding, Kelly started drinking and doing drugs again. She also started doing porn to support her habits. By the autumn of that year, Nance told her he didn't want to be with her if she was going to keep drinking and doing drugs. On November 17, 1991, Nance was at Bass Lake, California, filming Meatballs 4. He was on the phone with Kelly, who was threatening to kill herself. She told him that she would go through with it if he hung up. Minutes later, a terrible storm knocked out the phone lines at Nance's cabin. Nance and the movie director managed to find a working phone and they called the police. The police went to Kelly's home. They broke in and found her dead body. 33-year-old Kelly Jean Van Dyke had hanged herself. Nance continued to stay sober through the early 1990s. He got small parts in mostly forgettable movies like Voodoo starring Corey Feldman and Secret Agent Club starring Hulk Hogan. In the mid-1990s, Nan started drinking again. In 1997, Nance played a small role as a car mechanic in David Lynch's Lost Highway. Interestingly, the film featured a memorable character played by Robert Blake whom Nance lost the role of Perry Smith in In Cold Blood 30 years earlier. Years after appearing in Lost Highway, Blake would be arrested and tried for the murder of his wife. On December 29, 1996, Jack Nance met a couple of his friends for lunch. They noticed he had a black eye. Nance explained that he went to Winchell's Donut Shop at about 4 in the morning. He mouthed off to two guys he described as Latinos in their early 20s. He went inside and when he came out, the two men were waiting for him. They got into a fist fight and Nance was punched in the head. After lunch, Nance said he had a headache and he was going home. The next day, one of Nance's friends went to his apartment in Pasadena. He found the 53-year-old actor dead. An autopsy revealed that Jack Nance had died from blood force trauma. The medical examiner labeled his death a homicide. Unfortunately, the police had very little information to go on. No one at the donut shop saw the fight or knew who the men were. Nance also didn't describe the men beyond saying they were Latino men in their 20s so the case seems unlikely to be solved unless someone comes forward. It's been 26 years since Jack Nance was killed and the case is considered ice cold. Oddly enough, this is not the only unsolved murder linked to a racer head. Peter Ivers scored the film and he wrote the music and sang the song In Heaven, Lady and the Radiator Song. In 1983, Ivers was murdered in his Los Angeles apartment. We'll cover his case in our upcoming video, Three Unsolved Murders of Musicians. Number 1. Jenny Maxwell Jennifer Helene Maxwell was born in September 1941 in Brooklyn, New York. She was the only daughter of Norwegian immigrants. 
In 1958, 14-year-old Jenny was enrolled in drama school in New York City. One day, director Vincent Manelli was visiting the school. Vincent had been married to Judy Garland and their daughter was Liza Manelli. Vincenti was impressed with Jenny and he convinced her to come to Hollywood to read for a movie he was directing. The movie was Some Came Running, starring Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and Shirley MacLaine. Jenny did not get the part, but she did land other roles. Her first role was in the sitcom Bachelor Father, where she plays the high school rival of one of the main characters. This was followed by a guest spot on the hit sitcom Father Knows Best. On the set of Father Knows Best, she met 24-year-old Paul Rapp. Paul was working as an assistant director. Paul and Jenny started a whirlwind romance that resulted in them eloping in April 1958. Jenny was only 17 years old. The following year, she gave birth to a son, Brian. However, the marriage didn't last long. The couple separated in December 1961. Jenny continued to land TV roles on shows like Bonanza and The Twilight Zone. Then came her big break. She played the spoiled teenager, Ellie, in the musical romantic comedy Blue Hawaii, starring Elvis Presley. Arguably, Jenny's most memorable scene is when Presley's character spanks her for being naughty. In December 1963, Jenny and Paul's divorce was settled. She was awarded custody of their son, Brian. Jenny continued to get roles in television shows and movies into the mid-1960s. One of her biggest roles was in Take Her, She's Mine, starring Jimmy Stewart. Unfortunately, Jenny's private life was falling apart. She enjoyed the Hollywood lifestyle, which included drugs, alcohol, and a revolving door of men. But Jenny indulged in the lifestyle too much, and she lost custody of Brian. In 1968, Jenny decided to clean up her life and get Brian back. She thought that in order to do this, she needed to retire from acting. Her last role was a guest spot on the show The Wild Wild West in 1968. After that, at the age of 27, Jenny was no longer acting. She eventually got her son back. In February 1970, Jenny married a well-known divorce lawyer who was 21 years older than her, Irvin Rader, who went by the name Tip. Before becoming a lawyer, Tip had been a police officer. He had a shady reputation and he liked for people to think he had mob connections. Unfortunately, the marriage wasn't a happy one. Jenny and Tip constantly fought. Jenny filed for divorce several times but she didn't follow through with it. By 1978, Jenny had enough and she was ready to be done with the marriage. But her lawyer suggested staying with Tip until their 10th wedding anniversary because she would get a bigger settlement. So Jenny decided to stay, but she wasn't faithful. However, neither was Tip. Shortly after their 10th wedding anniversary, Jenny and Brian moved out. Around the same time, Tip had a strange experience. A prowler supposedly shot him in his backyard. Tip was wounded, but was superficial. It looked like a bullet had grazed him. Some of Tip's friends thought he lied about the prowler, and for some unknown reason, he had grazed himself with the bullet. He refused to report the incident to the police. On June 9, 1981, Jenny had minor surgery at Cedar sinai Hospital. Tip offered to drive her home when she was released the next day. Jenny accepted the offer. Tip and Jenny went out to lunch and then they went to Jenny's condo. In the lobby, both Tip and Jenny were shot. 39-year-old Jenny Rader died at the scene. 
60-year-old Tip Raider, was taken to the hospital and died hours later. The story from the media was that it was a robbery gone wrong. No arrests were made in the case, and the news quickly stopped reporting on it. For decades, the official story was that it was a robbery gone wrong. However, Jenny's family wasn't convinced that it was a botched robbery. They thought it was a mob hit because of Tip's shady relationships. Then in 2018, a journalist named Buddy Morehouse with the Livingston Post in Livingston County, Michigan, decided to investigate the case. Jay Rader was his mother's first cousin and his mother's health was failing. She had always wondered what happened to her cousin. Morehouse talked to a detective with Los Angeles Department's Wilshire Detective Bureau. The detective found the original case file which had the names of the two detectives who were assigned to the case. One of them had died, but Morehouse managed to track down the other detective, Mike Thies. Thies told them that they had solved a major part of the case in the weeks after the murders. In May 2019, Morehouse flew to Los Angeles and met with Thies. Thies told him that Tip was angry that Jenny would get a huge settlement from the divorce. In the months before the shooting, Tip had apparently asked three people to kill Jenny and her lover, but they had all turned him down. It's believed that Tip found someone to kill Jenny, and then the gunman was supposed to shoot him, but only wound him. This would give Tip plausible deniability if he became a suspect. But the gunman screwed up and fairly shot Tip. Thieves never thought it was a robbery because nothing had been stolen from the couple. Also, the couple was shot with a rare type of ammo. The same type of ammo was found in Tip's car. Thieves said that they never closed the case because they never found the shooter. His identity is still a mystery over 40 years later. But Thieves said that they are confident the Tip Raider was the mastermind of the shooting. Buddy Morehouse wrote a book about Jenny and her murder called The Murder of an Elvis Girl, solving the Jenny Maxwell case. Number 3. Jan Arden Jan Arden Ann Richards was born in Calgary, Alberta, but grew up in Springbank, Alberta. Her father was a construction contractor and her mother was a dental assistant. She has an older and younger brother, Ray and Patrick. After high school, Jan played in several bar bands. In 1985, she was discovered by a manager who helped her develop her adult contemporary sound. Six years later, in 1991, she signed with A&M slash Island slash Motown Records of Canada. In 1993, she released her debut album, Time for Mercy. It was a hit in Canada, and it was certified platinum. Jan's biggest success came in 1994 with the release of her album, Living Under June. It featured the singles, I Can Be Your Girl and Insensitive. Insensitive was a big hit, reaching number one in Canada and Australia, and number 12 on the Billboard Hot 200 in the United States. Living Under June went five times platinum in Canada and was certified gold in the United States. Jan Arden continued to release albums and had success in her native Canada. From her eight albums, she had 17 top 10 singles. She also wrote and recorded the theme song, Run Like Mad, for the international broadcast of Dawson's Creek. When Netflix acquired Dawson's Creek, Jan's song was used instead of Paula's Cole, I Don't Wanna Wait, because it was too expensive to license. The DVDs also used Run Like Mad in seasons 3 to 6. But, music-wise, Jan never found the same success outside of Canada as she did with her single, Insensitive. In 2006, she received a star on the Canadian Walk of Fame. In 2017, she was appointed a member of the Order of Canada. 
Jan Arden has also done some acting. She's appeared on the television shows Hell on Wheels, The Detour, Working Moms, and Winona Herb, amongst others. In 2019, Jan Arden starred in a sitcom of a fictionalized version of her life called Jan. In the show, she hopes to outdo her rival, Sarah McLaughlin. So far, there have been three seasons in the Christmas special of Jan. The show has included guest stars like Michael Bublé, Katie Lang, Brian Adams, and Sarah McLaughlin. Before Jan Arden launched her career, her family experienced an incredible hardship. Creston is a small town in southeast British Columbia. In 1992, it had a population of about 4,200 people. 21-year-old Carrie Marshall lived there with her four-year-old son and her partner, Stan Pollock. When the summer in 1992, they were preparing to move over 90 miles away to the hamlet of Tata Creek. They wanted to move away to help Pollock with his sobriety. Pollock was involved with the drug trade. Just before they moved, Marshall, her son, and Pollock were temporarily living in a shack outside of Creston. On December 3, 1992, Marshall's friend drove her to the shack. There were two sets of tire tracks in the fresh snow, and Marshall noted to her friend that someone had recently been there. Her friend left her alone at the shack at about 5 p.m. After that, Carrie Marshall disappeared, and she was reported missing the next day. Three days later, some clothing was found on a logging road about a 10 minute drive from the shack. The clothes led to the dead body of 21 year old Carrie Marshall. She was lying spread eagle and was naked, except for a single pink sock. The body didn't show any signs of self defense. The medical examiners thought that the murder was sexually motivated. It's believed that she was punched into unconsciousness and then raped. She had internal injuries and bled to death. The murder weapon was never found, but the medical examiner thought she was killed with a tire iron. She was beaten with the weapon while she was still unconscious. The police had a suspect, even while Marshall was just missing. That was 33-year-old DeRay Richards, the older brother of Jan Arden. Ray had recently moved to Creston. He had to spend his weekends in a local jail as part of a sentence for threatening a woman in Alberta. Ray had a history of violence against women. In one case, he brought a sex worker back to a hotel room. He strangled her and then sexually assaulted her. The police could also connect Ray to Marshall. They met about two or three months after DeRay moved to Creston at a friend's home. On Friday night, DeRay had dropped off his car at his friend's home before going to jail for the weekend. Apparently that evening, DeRay kept watching Marshall. DeRay was back at his friend's house the following Monday and Marshall was there again. This time, DeRay was drunk. He asked Marshall to go four-wheeling with him and she turned him down. DeRay then said, What's the matter? Are you scared to go for a ride with me? Are you scared I'm going to rape you? Marshall said, No, that's not it. DeRay then responded, Well, you should be. Marshall then replied, Are you telling me I should be afraid of you? DeRay replied, No, that's not what I meant. Also, there were distinctive tire marks in the snow outside the shack. The police had someone compare the tracks to the treads on DeRay's car and he said it was a match. Close to the shack was a preservative treated red western cedar telephone pole. It had recently been struck by a car. Ray's car had damage on the right rear end corner with paint on it. The paint was matched to the paint on the pole. There was also a sliver of untreated red western cedar under his bumper. The police searched the race car and found two drops of blood. DNA testing was done and an expert said that the blood was from the same genotype 
as Kerry Marshall. However, it wasn't an exact match. One in 12 people have the same genotype. Found near the body was an empty Luby Lube motor oil can without a cap. That type of oil wasn't common in British Columbia, but DeRay had several bottles in his car. When the police searched the car, one notable item that they didn't find was the tire iron. The police interviewed the man who sold the car to DeRay, and he said that there was a tire iron in the car when he sold it. However, the prosecution never found any definitive evidence that connected DeRay to the murder. They found what they called 41 threads of evidence that, when stitched together, made a strong fabric that proved he was guilty. So DeRay was charged with Carrie Marshall's murder. After he was arrested, the police in Calgary investigated him regarding the unsolved murders of several sex workers that happened while he was living in Calgary. However, only one of those victims was named Tracy Mauder. In October 1992, Mauder was 26 years old and a single mother. She had recently been diagnosed with cancer. She turned to sex work to make money for plane tickets so her sons could stay with her parents while she was getting treatment. She was last seen alive on October 28, 1992. Her body was found three days later in a grassy field. She had been beaten and stabbed to death. The police did not charge Sheree in Maunder's murder, but they did say he remained a viable suspect in three unsolved murders of sex workers in Calgary. They did not clarify if that included Maunder's murder or if he was cleared in that case. It's believed that a serial killer was preying on women, mostly sex workers, in Calgary in the early 1990s. We'll cover that case in our next Unsolved Serial Murders video, which will release in early 2023. Nevertheless, DeRay Richards went to trial in the spring of 1994 for the murder of Carrie Marshall. This trial lasted 74 days and the jury deliberated for 16 hours. A jailhouse informant testified. He said that DeRay had confessed to him. He said that DeRay told him that Marshall was his girlfriend. They went out to the woods and had sex on the hood of his car. He then hit her and walked away. Dre was found guilty and he was sentenced to 25 years to life. Dre always maintained that he was innocent. He appealed his case in 1997 and he lost. He planned to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada but they refused to grant him an extension of time to apply. After that, he exhausted all his appeals. In 2011, Jan Arden talked about her brother's incarceration on a talk show. She said she has slowly been watching her brother die behind bars. He was always sick and he had sores that would never heal. She thought he had served his time and deserved to be released. In 2016, Vancouver lawyer Brock Martin and law students at the University of BC's Innocence Project filed a 267-page submission to the Minister of Justice. They claim that DeRay is a victim of a miscarriage of justice. They examined the 41 pieces of evidence which the prosecution said were the threads that created a fabric that proved DeRay was guilty. In response, they wrote, A series of threads stitched together will give the appearance of a strong and resilient fabric. But on closer inspection, with only a little tugging on the fabric, the threads unravel. Almost every thread, evaluated individually, is suspect and weak. What is left is far from a reliable and sturdy garment, and it cannot be trusted. They contend that the police had DeRay as a suspect from the very beginning, and they developed tunnel vision. One big problem with the case was that in February 2003, nine years after the trial, a low-ranking officer took the evidence to a sawmill and burned it. The Crescent Police later said that this was a routine procedure. 
Ture said that he believes that the police would have done anything to ensure the conviction stuck to him. One of the most significant problems Marlin and the students found was with the oil can that was found near Marshall's body. It was flattened and appeared to be old. Two years before the murder, the company started adding a sticker to their bottles. The bottle that was found didn't have the sticker, so the bottle could have been there for years. Another problem was the tire track analysis. The analysis was performed by an employee of a tire store who was also DeRay Richards' roommate. He was the one who put the tires on the car. Before he testified, he was hypnotized. Also, in the years since the trial, it's been proven that visually examining tire tracks is not a scientifically accurate way to analyze tire tracks. Forensic experts in tires require years of training and education. Also, the distance between the center of the tire tracks and the snow was 6.2 feet. The distance between the center of DeRay's tires was only 5.2 feet, which is a difference of a foot. Also, the DNA testing said that the blood could have belonged to 1 in 12 people, which has only been used once in court to support a conviction. That was DeRay Richards' case. There was also the jailhouse informant. The details he gave did not match the evidence of the crime scene. There was also evidence that was ignored. 183 strands of hair, including pubic hair, were found on Marshall's body. None of it belonged to DeRay. No further testing was done on the hair, and the hairs were destroyed with the rest of the evidence for the case. After receiving the submission, the Justice Minister said he would review the case. But in October 2018, over 25 years after DeRay was convicted, he was permitted to leave the prison to visit family. Then in June 2020, before a decision was made on the case, DeRay was granted day parole. So he was released to a halfway house. It's believed at this time that DeRay Richards is still on parole. He still maintains that he did not kill Carrie Marshall. Number 2. Terrence Howard Terrence Howard was born in March 1969 in Chicago, Illinois to Tyrone Howard and Anita Williams. For a short time, the family lived in Cleveland, Ohio. After his parents' divorce, he moved to Los Angeles, California with his mother, who wanted to pursue an acting career. Terrence also had a passion for acting. He got the acting bug from his great-grandmother, Minnie Gentry. Minnie lived in New York City, and Terrence spent the summers with her. Minnie mostly worked as a stage actress, but she did have minor roles on television shows and movies like All My Children, The Cosby Show, Bad Lieutenant, and Law and & Order. After high school, Terrence moved to New York City to attend the Pratt Institute, but he didn't graduate. He said that he studied chemical engineering, but this has never been verified. He eventually committed himself to acting. His first television role was on The Cosby Show, but his role ended up being edited out. When Terrence found out, he confronted the creator and star of the show, Bill Cosby. This was the start of Terrence's reputation for being difficult to work with. Terrence's breakout role was playing the oldest member of the Jackson 5, Jackie Jackson, in the 1992 ABC miniseries, The Jacksons, An American Dream. This led to guest spots on shows like Coach, Family Matters, and Picket Fences. In 1995, he landed a role as a secondary character in the film, Dead Presidents. That same year, he had a supporting role in the drama, Mr. Holland's Opus. Terrence thought that these two movies would land him roles as a lead actor, but they didn't and he continued to find work as a supporting actor, so he quit acting for a while. He moved to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and worked as a carpet cleaner. 
but he couldn't shake the acting bug and decided to pursue the career again. He got roles in movies like Big Mama's House, Hearts War, and the notoriously bad Mariah Carey vehicle, Flitter. But 2004 proved to be a breakout year for Terrence. He had a supporting role in the Academy Award winning movie, Ray. He also had a notable role in the ensemble cast of Crash, which won the Academy Award for Best Picture. In 2005, Terrence starred as a pimp and aspiring MC in Hustle and Flow. He was nominated for Best Performance by an actor in a leading role. He lost to Philip Seymour Hoffman in Capote. From there, Terrence Howard has gone on to have a steady acting career with roles in films like Four Brothers, Iron Man, Red Tails, and Sabotage. His most notable role of late is starring in Fox's music drama, Empire. Terrence's career has also been marked with personal problems. This includes allegations of spousal abuse. His second wife filed two restraining orders against him. In 2015, Terrence admitted to hitting his first wife in an interview with Rolling Stone. The darkest story from Terrence's life happened when he was just a toddler and living in Cleveland, Ohio. In December 1971, John Fitzpatrick was 36 years old. He lived in Euclid, a Cleveland, Ohio suburb. He had four children and his wife was seven months pregnant. John was university educated and a second lieutenant in the army. After the army, he got a job as a salesman with U.S. Steel Corp. In the winter of 1971, he was having a house built in the suburbs. This would be his family's last Christmas in their Euclid home. On December 21st, John and his wife decided to take their kids to Higby's department store in Cleveland to see Santa Claus. John stood in line with his three youngest children while his wife and eldest child did some shopping. In line, they encountered 21-year-old Tyrone Howard, his wife, and their three sons. One of them was two-year-old Terrence. In many ways, Tyrone Howard was the opposite of John Fitzpatrick. Tyrone dropped out of high school and had problems holding down jobs. He hadn't worked in months because he had injured himself at a warehouse job. He had tried to join the army, but he was rejected. As they stood in line, several people, including John, accused Tyrone of butting in line. John and Tyrone started arguing, and both men used obscenities. There are different accounts as to what happened next. Some witnesses said that John used racial epithets. One witness said that John said, That's a cheap trick you pulled, buddy. That's going to set your race back five years. Then John and Tyrone got into a physical fight. John supposedly threw a punch and Tyrone kicked him. John got Tyrone pinned against the wall. He supposedly kneed Tyrone in the groin and he started bleeding because of an earlier injury. Then Tyrone started stabbing John in the thigh and the neck with a bladed tool. It's unclear what the tool was or where it came from. Some people claim that they saw Tyrone pull a knife from his coat. Other people, including Tyrone, said it was a nail file. A woman supposedly handed it to Tyrone. After John was stabbed, he fell to the ground. Tyrone stood over John and said it was self-defense, so he would stay until the police arrived. Tyrone then said he hoped that he didn't die. Before the police got there, Tyrone ran away. 36-year-old John Fitzpatrick was stabbed six times. He did not survive his wounds. The instrument that was used to stab John was never found. Tyrone Howard was arrested the next day and charged with second-degree murder. His trial started on May 30th, 1972. Tyrone said that he had acted in self-defense. The trial lasted six days. The jury deliberated for 14 hours over two days. 
Tyrone was found guilty of the lesser charge of manslaughter. He was sentenced to 1 to 20 years in prison. Tyrone served 11 months and he was paroled on good behavior. In 2004, Terrence Howard was on Oprah promoting the film Crash and he talked about the incident. He claimed that it was racially motivated. He said that his father had lighter skin. At some point, he let his mother and brother join them in line. Terrence said that John Fitzpatrick asked him why he let those N-words cut in line. Tyrone said that was his wife and kids. Then they started fighting. After the interview aired, Tyrone spoke to a reporter for the Cleveland newspaper, The Plain Dealer. He explained that he was letting his wife in line, and people, including John Fitzpatrick, didn't know it was his wife. They thought he was letting her cut in line. John said something to her, and Tyrone told him that if he had anything to say, to say it to him and leave his wife out of it. John said that was a cheap trick, buddy. Then they started fighting. Tyrone was quoted as saying, It was nothing racial that went down. It was two men standing there, both of us acting like damn fools, instead of one of us taking the man's role and walking away. In 2019, Terrence Howard announced that he was retiring from acting. But, according to IMDb, he appeared in four movies in 2020 and 2021. He also has five movies and one TV show to be released in the next few years. Number 1. Woody Harrelson Woodrow Harrelson was born in Midland, Texas in July 1961 to Charles and Diane Harrelson. When Woody was seven, Charles abandoned the family. In 1973, Diane moved her three sons to her hometown of Lebanon, Ohio. In high school, Woody started acting in school plays. After high school, he attended Hanover College in Hanover, Indiana. In 1983, he graduated with a degree in English and theater arts. He then moved to New York City looking for acting work. In 1985, he was an understudy for Neil Simon's play, Bloxy Blues. But that same year, Woody got the role that would change his life. That was playing the lovable but simple-minded bartender, Woody Boyd, on the NBC sitcom, Cheers. He joined the cast in season four, replacing the character, Coach, when the actor who betrayed him Nicholas Colastano died suddenly in February 1985. Woody appeared in 200 episodes of the hit sitcom. For his role as Woody, he was nominated for an Emmy Award five times. He won once in 1989 for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Comedy Series. While appearing on Cheers, Woody made his way into movies. His first film role was the 1986 sports comedy Wildcats starring Goldie Hawn. His first starring role in a movie was 1992's White Men Can't Jump. The following year, he starred alongside Demi Moore and Robert Redford in the erotic drama Indecent Proposal. In 1994, Woody starred in Oliver Stone's controversial Natural Born Killers. In 1997, he was nominated for the first time for an Academy Award for playing pornographer and free speech advocate Larry Flint in The People vs. Larry Flint. He lost to Jeffrey Rush in Shine. In 2010, Woody was nominated for another Academy Award Best Supporting Actor for his role in the military drama The Messenger. Once again, he lost. This time, it was to Christoph Waltz in Inglorious Bastards. He was nominated for a third time in 2018 for the crime drama Three Billboards Outside of Ebbing, Missouri. He lost to his Three Billboards co-star, Sam Rockwell. During his nearly 40-year career, Woody Harrelson has starred in movies and television shows in almost every genre. 
He's appeared in small independent films like Trans-Siberian, Defender, and Rampart. He's also appeared in mega blockbusters like the Zombieland movies, the Hunger Games franchise, War for the Planet of the Apes, and Venom, Let There Be Carnage. Another one of his most notable roles, for which he received another Emmy nomination, was playing Detective Marty Hart in the first season of True Detective. However, this time he lost to Brian Cranston for his role as the high school science teacher turned meth kingpin Walter White in Breaking Bad. It was the fifth and final time Cranston won for the role of Walter White. While Woody Harrelson has had an amazing career and is one of the most famous actors in Hollywood, there is a very dark chapter in his family's history book. His father, Charles Voight Harrelson, was born in July 1938 in Lovelady, Texas. He started off selling encyclopedias in California, but then he became a professional gambler. In 1960, Charles was convicted of armed robbery. He was sentenced to five years in prison, but he only served several months. At some point after this, he became a contract killer. In the late 1960s, 31-year-old Alan Harry Berg was an executive in his family's carpet business. On May 28, 1968, Alan was lured to a bar by a woman who promised him sexual favors. After that, he disappeared. Al's remains were found a few months later, on November 8, 1968, on a deserted beach after a private detective received an anonymous tip. There was a bullet hole in his skull and a rope around his neck. Charles was arrested on November 20, 1968. At this point, Charles was no longer with Woody's mother. He was living with his common-law wife. She was also arrested. It turned out that she was the one who told the private detective where to find the remains. She knew about the remains because she saw Charles kidnap and murder Allen Berg. He was supposedly murdered on the orders of a man named Frank de Maria. He supposedly paid Charles $1,500 which is about $12,000 in 2022. It's suspected that Di Maria was angry at Alan's father, Nathan, who was his rival in the carpet business. Another motive was that Charles killed Alan over gambling debts. Alan supposedly owed Di Maria $7,000. A month after Charles was charged with Alan's murder, he was charged with a second murder. On July 6, 1968, a month after Alan was killed, 30-year-old Sam DeGilia Jr. of Hearn, Texas, went missing. DeGilia was a wealthy grain operator and father of four. His body was found five days later in a shack in McAllen, Texas. He had been shot twice in the head. The police discovered that DeGilia's lifelong friend and business partner Pete Thomas Scamardo was in to heroin distribution, but he had lost a shipment. To make up for the missing money, Scamardo took out a life insurance policy on his friend. He then paid Charles and 43-year-old Jerry Watkins to kill him. It was $2,000 per man for the hit, which is about $17,000 in 2022. Watkins and Scamardo were also arrested. Charles Harrelson went to trial in September 1970 for the murder of Alan Berg. The star witness was his former common-law wife who claimed to have seen the murder. She admitted that she was the woman who lured Alan to the bar. Charles' lawyer said that other people could have had motive for killing Alan. He said that Alan was known to hang out with gangsters. He also set up a front for gangsters to run gambling schemes in Galveston, Texas. The problem was that Alan liked to gamble and he wasn't very good at it. Charles' lawyer said that Alan double-crossed someone he shouldn't have and this is how he ended up being murdered. 
Charles' lawyer had two men testify that Charles was with them at the time of the murder. The jury deliberated for two hours and 40 minutes. Charles was acquitted on all charges. But after he was acquitted, he returned to jail to await his trial for the murder of Sam Nigelia Jr. That trial started in November 1971. The prosecution's star witness was Jerry Watkins. Watkins took a plea deal and testified against Charles Escamardo in exchange for immunity. Escamardo was tried separately in March 1970, months before Charles went to trial. He was found guilty of being an accomplice to murder. He was amazingly only given seven years of probation. At Charles's trial in November 1971, Hawkins said that he was the driver and he saw Charles suit to Gaglia. Charles' lawyer had a nightclub singer testify. She said she was with Charles when the murder happened. The trial lasted 23 days and the jury deliberated for 13 hours. They ended up being deadlocked, so a mistrial was declared. Charles went to trial again in July 1973. This time, the nightclub singer didn't testify because she was worried that she would be arrested for perjury. This time, the jury deliberated for six hours. Charles was found guilty of murder. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison. He had already served four years and nine months awaiting his trial. So he served another five years and he was released in 1978. But he was far from finished with his life of crime. John H. Wood Jr. was a U.S. District Judge. He had been given the name Maximum John because he liked to sentence people at the top end of the sentencing guidelines. He had a particular dislike for those involved in the drug trade because he thought it was the source of many of society's problems. On May 29, 1979, Judge Wood was getting ready to leave his home in San Antonio, Texas. He noticed that one of his tires was flat. As he examined the tire, he was shot in the back with a high-power rifle. He was dead within minutes of being shot. Judge Wood was the first American judge to be assassinated in over a century. Since Wood was known as a tough judge, there were a lot of possible suspects. But it wasn't long before a prime suspect emerged. A few months before the assassination, in February 1979, 33-year-old Jamil Shagra, who went by the name Jimmy, was arrested for drug trafficking. Jimmy lived in El Paso, Texas, and was considered one of the biggest marijuana smugglers in the United States. He was scheduled to go in front of Judge Wood, and he was looking at a life sentence. Instead, after Wood's murder in August 1979, Jimmy went in front of another judge, and he was sentenced to 30 years without parole. But instead of going to jail, Jimmy jumped bail and vanished. He was arrested six months later in Las Vegas, Nevada. He was sent to Leavenworth Prison in Kansas. In 1980, Jimmy met career criminal Jerry Ray James and he bragged about having Woods killed. James agreed to wear a wire and record their conversations. Around this time, Charles Harrelson was dealing with a serious addiction to cocaine. He was out on bond while awaiting trial for possession of cocaine, a gun, and loaded dice. On September 1st, 1980, Charles was driving east of Van Horn, Texas. He was suffering from drug-induced paranoia. He pulled off the interstate to examine the muffler, which was rattling. He attempted to fix it by shooting it with a 44 Magnum. Instead, he shot the tire. While holding the gun in his hand, he tried to hitchhike. No one picked him up, but several people called the police. When the police arrived, Charles pointed the gun at his head. This led to a six-hour standoff. During the standoff, he confessed to killing Judge Wood. 
He also said he assassinated John F. Kennedy. The standoff finally ended when a friend of Charles convinced him to surrender. Not long after Charles was arrested, his lawyer passed on some information to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Charles knew that one of the judge's tires was slashed before the shooting. This information had never been made public. Investigators continued to investigate Jimmy Shagra and his family. Jimmy's brother, Joe, was a lawyer, and investigators thought he was involved in his brother's drug business. The investigators started recording the brothers' conversations in a prison meeting room in October 1980. During the conversations over the next several months, Jimmy talked to Joe about the assassination of Judge Wood. This included hiring Charles Harrelson to carry out the hit. The FBI investigated the murder of Judge Wood for years. And finally, in April 1983, five people were indicted for the murder of Judge Wood. They were Jimmy Shagra, his wife Elizabeth, and his brother Joe along with Charles Harrelson and his wife, Joanne Harrelson. Jimmy and Joe were accused of paying a quarter million dollars to Charles, which is the equivalent of just over a million dollars in 2022, to murder the judge. Jimmy's wife was accused of delivering the payout, while Charles' wife was accused of buying the rifle. Joe ended up making a plea deal. In exchange for his testimony, he pleaded guilty to conspiracy and he was given a 10-year sentence. However, there was a caveat. He would testify against everyone but his brother. Joanne Harrelson went to trial first in November 1981 for buying the rifle. When she registered to buy the rifle, she used the first name Fay and the last name King, which reads, Faking. She was found guilty of giving a false name and address when buying the gun. She was sentenced to three years of prison. But this was only the start of her legal problems. Charles, Joanne, and Jimmy's wife, Elizabeth Shagra, went to trial in September 1982 for a conspiracy to commit murder and obstruction of justice. There was 40 days of testimony. The jury deliberated for 18 hours over three days. All three were found guilty. Before they were sentenced, Jimmy Shagra went to trial. His trial lasted a month. A notable difference between his trial and the trial of the other three was that Joe Shagra didn't testify. The jury deliberated for 20 hours over four days. They found Jimmy not guilty of murder. While he was found guilty of obstruction of justice, tax evasion, and possession of marijuana. A month after Jimmy's trial, Charles Harrelson was given two life sentences, plus five years. His wife, Joanne, was sentenced to 25 years in prison. Elizabeth Shagra was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Jimmy Shagra, the supposed mastermind, was only sentenced to 15 years in prison. Joe Shagra served six and a half years in prison. In 1996, at the age of 50, he was killed in a car accident. Jimmy later admitted to being the mastermind of the murder, hoping that his confession would get his wife released early. But that didn't happen. Elizabeth died at age 41 of ovarian cancer in 1997 while behind bars. Joanne Harrelson was released from prison in 1997. According to a newspaper article, she has died since then. Although Charles Harrelson was acquitted of the murder of Allenberg, he later confessed to it. He later boasted that his body count was as high as 50. An associate said he may have been involved in 50 murders, like being the driver, but he didn't kill that many people. He said that Charles killed six people at most. There are even conspiracy theorists who say that Charles was involved in the assassination of John F. Kennedy. 
Woody Harrelson said his dad was never around much when he was a kid. In 2012, he talked to The Guardian about when he first heard about his father being in legal trouble. He said, I was 11 or 12 when I heard the name mentioned on a car radio. I was in the car waiting for a lady who was picking me up from school, helping my mom. Anyways, I was listening to the radio and it was talking about Charles V. Harrelson and his trial for a murder and blah blah blah. And I'm sitting there thinking, there can't be another Charles V. Harrelson. I mean, that's my dad. It was a wild realization. In 1988, in an interview with People Magazine, Woody said that he visits his father in prison once a year. In 1997, Charles tried to get a new trial and Woody paid for his legal expenses. But he ultimately lost his appeal. In March 2007, 68-year-old Charles Harrelson was found dead in a cell in ADX Florence Supermax Prison in Colorado. The cause of death was a heart attack. Number 3. Dave Navarro David Michael Navarro was born in June 1967 in Santa Monica, California. In 1975, when Dave was 7, his parents, James Ralph Navarro, who went by Mike, and Constance Colleen Navarro, divorced. After the split up, Dave lived with his mother in Bel Air, but his parents shared custody. Constance had worked as a model, and she had been model on The Price is Right. Dave started playing the guitar when he was 12, and he was heavily influenced by Jimi Hendrix. In high school, he played in the marching band with Stephen Perkins. On March 4, 1983, 15-year-old Dave was thinking of staying at his mother's home, but he ended up going to his father's home. The next day, Mike Navarro received a call from a person who was a mutual friend of him and his ex-wife. The friend said that Constance had missed an appointment. Mike tried to call Constance several times, but he couldn't get a hold of her. He went over to her condo and made a grisly discovery. 41-year-old Constance was dead. She had been shot in the chest. Mike also found the body of Constance's good friend, 42-year-old Susan Jory. She had been shot once in the head. The house had not been ransacked and nothing had been stolen. The police quickly identified a suspect, Constance's ex-boyfriend, John Riccardi. Constance and Riccardi started dating in 1980. By 1982, the relationship had unraveled and they broke up and got back together several times. In January 1983, Constance ended the relationship permanently. Riccardi then began to stalk Constance. In February 1983, Dave was home from school because he was sick. He was home alone in his mother's condo and he heard someone come inside. He thought it was his mother, but it was Riccardi. He was armed with a gun and he aimed it at Dave. Dave kept Riccardi calm and then Riccardi handcuffed him to a toilet. When Constance came home, she and Riccardi argued for about 20 or 30 minutes. Then Riccardi came into the washroom and uncuffed Dave. He told Dave not to tell his mother what had happened. Dave was afraid, so he didn't say anything to her. So while the police had a suspect in the murders, they couldn't find him. John Riccardi was gone. While no progress was made on the case, life, as it does, continued for Dave Navarro. In 1986, when he was 19, he joined Jane's Addiction, a new band started by Perry Farrell from the ashes of his former band, Psycom. Dave was recommended by Jane's Addiction drummer, Stephen Perkins, who went to high school with Dave. The band quickly found success and they signed with Warner Brothers Records. In August 1988, they released their debut studio album, 
nothing shocking. It was a moderate hit, peaking at 103 on the Billboard 200. Two years later, in August 1991, Shane's Addiction released their second album, Ritual de lo Habitual. It reached number 12 on the Billboard 200. That same month, America's Most Wanted aired a segment about Dave's mother's murder. They told people to be on the lookout for John Riccardi. After the episode aired, the show's hotline received a tip. The caller said that Riccardi was living in Houston, Texas. Riccardi was arrested on January 4th, 1991, eight years after the murder. In 1991, Shane's addiction broke up because of personal problems between the band members. In September 1993, Dave joined the Red Hot Chili Peppers. In July 1994, Sean Riccardi went to trial for the murder of Constance Navarro and Susan Jory. He was found guilty and he was sentenced to death. Weeks after the trial, Dave Navarro played with the Chili Peppers at Woodstock 94. He then recorded his only album with the Chili Peppers, 1995's One Hot Minute, which featured the hits My Friends, Aeroplane, and Warped. Dave Navarro also played guitar on the Lance Morissette's You Ought to Know and Piggy by Nine Inch Nails. Unfortunately, during this time, Dave was addicted to cocaine and heroin. His drug addiction was the main reason he was asked to leave the Chili Peppers in 1998. In the late 1990s, Dave managed to kick his drug habit. He played guitar with different bands and even recorded two more Chains Addiction albums. He also played on songs by P. Diddy, Christina Aguilera, Gene Simmons, and Tommy Lee. Dave Navarro also started to do some TV work. In 2005 and 2006, he hosted two seasons of the singing competition show, Rockstar. In 2012, Sean Riccardi's death penalty was overturned because of an error by the judge. He was sentenced to life without parole. That same year, Dave became host and one of the judges on the reality tattoo competition show, Ink Masters. The show ran for eight seasons. That was announced that the show would be revived in 2022 and Dave Navarro would return as host. In 2015, Dave Navarro released the documentary, Morning Sun. The documentary is about the murder of his mother and his attempts to deal with her murder through drugs and his art. Dave Navarro's mother's killer, 87-year-old John Riccardi, is serving a sentence at the California Institution for Men. Number 2. Nisi Nash Spatz Nisi Nash Spatz was born Carol Denise Sensley in February 1970 in Palmdale, California. She attended California State University, Dominguez Hills, in Carson, California, and got a degree in drama. Her first acting role was a minor one in the 1995 dramedy, Boys on the Side. The following year, she made her television debut with a minor role on Fox's Party of Five. Her first major role was a four-episode story arc on CBS's hospital drama, City of Angels, in 2000. Nisi continued to get guest spots on shows like NYPD Blue, Judging Amy, CSI, and ER. 2003 was a big year for Nisi. She was cast in Comedy Central's Reno 911 as Deputy Renisha Williams. The show initially ran for six seasons on Comedy Central. It was revived in 2020 to air on the streaming platform Quibi. They were contracted to make two seasons for Quibi. The seventh season was made available on Quibi, but Quibi was a disaster and it only lasted nine months. So the eighth season premiered on Roku. 
Reno 911 also spawned two movies, Reno 911 Miami in 2007 and Reno 911 The Hunt for Hunan in 2021. Niecy appeared in all eight seasons in both movies. She is also set to appear in the 2022 movie, Reno 911, It's a Wonderful Heist. Also in 2003, Niecy became the host of Clean Home, a home makeover and interior design show on the Style Network. In each episode, professionals help a family clean and declare their home. Then they have a yard sale and use the profits to do home maintenance. Nisi hosted the show for 10 seasons. In 2010, the show won the Daytime Emmy Award for Outstanding Daytime Special. After a clean house in Reno 911, Nisi continued to find roles in films and television shows regularly. This included the HBO comedy Getting On, for which she was nominated for two Primetime Emmys. She also starred in the TNT dramedy Claws for four seasons. In 2019, she was in Netflix's limited series When They See Us. Once again, she was nominated for an Emmy. 2022 was another big year for Nisi Nash Bats. She co starred in Monster, Dahmer, The Jeffrey Dahmer Story. Dahmer was a huge hit for Netflix and is one of their most watched series ever. Nisi was also cast as the lead in the spin off of the ABC police drama The Rookie. The Rookie, Feds, debuted in September 2022. Nisi has three children with her former husband, Don Nash. In 2020, she married singer Jessica Betts. Onisi has had a successful career filled with many comedic roles. The roots of her comedy are depressing. Nisi had a younger brother, Michael Ensley. On February 22, 1993, a day before Nisi's 23rd birthday, 17-year-old Michael attended school at Reseda High School in Los Angeles. Michael was part of a group of young men who graffitied surfaces. That morning, he got into an argument with a 15-year-old boy named Robert Lee Heard Jr., who was in a rival graffiti crew. Heard was not supposed to be at school that day because he had been expelled. As the boys argued in the busy school hallway, Heard pulled out a gun and shot Michael in the chest. Heard ran from the school. 17-year-old Michael Ensley was rushed to the hospital, but tragically, he was pronounced dead a short time later. Robert Hurd was arrested a short distance from the school. In April 1993, Hurd was convicted of murder. He was sentenced to the maximum. He would have to stay in the custody of the California Youth Authority until he was 25. Nisi and Michael's mother, Margaret Ensley, was deeply bothered by Michael's murder. She blamed the school for having lax security. After the murder, Margaret was understandably depressed. Nisi knew that she could get her mother to laugh. So she worked on her comedy skills to lift her mother's spirit. Margaret eventually started the group Mothers Against Violence in Schools also known as Mavis. Today, Nisi is the face of the organization. In 2001, Robert Hurd was released and he moved to Shreveport, Louisiana. In 2003, Hurd was involved in a domestic dispute. He was in an apartment with his girlfriend, her two children, and his girlfriend's friend. Robert fired several gunshots and the friend escaped. Then Heard barricaded himself inside the apartment with his girlfriend and her children. When the police arrived, Heard fired several shots at them. Luckily, no one was shot. There was a 30 minute standoff. Then Heard surrendered peacefully. 
He was convicted of attempted murder. He was incarcerated and then released in July 2011. After he was released, he married Dimitri Doyle. Four months after getting married, in September 2012, the police were called to the couple's home. They found 35-year-old Demetria dead in a pool of blood. Her body was badly burned. She had been stabbed over 40 times and then set on fire. Heard was arrested and charged with second-degree murder. He went to trial nearly five years later. The trial lasted two days. Then the jury voted 11 to 1 to convict him of second-degree murder. In Louisiana at the time, the jury did not have to come to a unanimous verdict when convicting someone. So Heard was found guilty and he was sentenced to life without parole. But then, in April 2020, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that Louisiana juries must come to a unanimous decision when convicting someone. So a new trial was ordered for Robert Hurd. He went to trial again in April 2022. He was found guilty of second-degree murder and he was sentenced to life without the chance of parole. He is currently serving a sentence at the Louisiana State Prison in Angola, Louisiana. Number 1. Chuck Palahniuk Chuck Palahniuk is a best-selling author, best known for his 1996 novel, Fight Club, which was made into a 1999 movie directed by David Fincher and starring Edward Norton and Brad Pitt. Charles Michael Palahniuk was born in Pasco, Washington on February 21, 1962 to Fred and Carol Palahniuk. The family lived in a mobile home in Burbank, Washington. When Chuck was 14, his parents divorced. After that, Chuck and his siblings spent much of their time at their maternal grandparents' cattle ranch. Chuck had never met his maternal grandparents because they had died years earlier when his father was still a child. He had heard they had died of diphtheria. When Chuck was 18 years old, his father, Fred, told him the truth. Fred was one of Nick and Preska Polnick's 13 children. Preska often went by the name Paula. When Chuck explains how to pronounce his name, he explains it's a combination of his grandparents' names, Paula and Nick. The family lived on a farm in Elmira, Idaho. On December 16, 1943, Nick and Paula had a series of arguments. Apparently, it was over the purchase of an expensive sewing machine. Nick grabbed a shotgun and shot 50-year-old Paula to death in front of their oldest child, a daughter who was 15. Nick then shot himself. He was 53 years old. When Chuck talks about the murders to journalists, he said that his father, who was just four, hid under a bed while his dad searched for him. After he couldn't find him, he shot himself. Chuck attended the University of Oregon's School of Journalism and graduated in 1986. He settled in Portland, Oregon. He got a job with a newspaper but decided to leave. He found work as a front axle installation man and a service documentation specialist at Freightliner Trucks. He worked there for 13 years while he worked on his writing. In 1995, he wrote the book that he would become famous for, Fight Club. It was published in August 1996. He won several awards at Fox 2000 Pictures, purchased the film rights. Fight Club was filmed in 1998. In January 1999, Chuck's second novel, Survivor, was published. In the spring of 1999, Chuck's father, Fred, was dating a lawyer, 44-year-old Donna Fontaine. In the last week of May 1999, Fred and Donna were spending the weekend at Donna's brother's home. 
Zahn's brother, Gary Fontaine, lived outside of Kendrick, Idaho. Around 7.30 p.m. on May 29, 1999, Zahn's brother, Gary, returned home after being at a friend's home. He saw that Donna's car was in the driveway. He smelled smoke and discovered his garage was on fire. When the fire department arrived, the garage was engulfed in flames. Several people were there and they tried to put out the fire. This included Dale Shackleford, Donna's ex-husband, his fiance, Sonia Bids, and her parents, John and Mary Abitz. After the fire was put out, two bodies were found inside of it. They were burned beyond recognition. They were eventually identified as 44-year-old Donna Fontaine and 59-year-old Fred Polinek. The medical examiner determined that they had both been shot to death before the fire. They both had been shot with two guns, which belonged to Donna. The fire chief concluded that the fire was an act of arson. The police suspected that Donna's ex-husband, Dale Shackleford, killed the couple. Shackleford and Donna got married in December 1995. They split up in the summer of 1997 and divorced in November 1997. In early 1998, Donna filed charges against Shackleford claiming he had raped her in July 1997. The police believe that Shackleford killed Donna to beat the rape charges. The only evidence against him would have been her testimony. The problem for the police was that they didn't have any evidence that tied Shackleford to the murders. The police talked to three women that Shackleford had dated. They all said that Shackleford had asked them to help him kill Donna. One of them even attempted to kill Donna twice, but backed out both times. They all said that Shackleford was abusive and he had sexually degraded them. The police interviewed a man who lived near the crime scene. He said that Shackleford had asked him to provide an alibi for the time of the murders. He also asked him the best way to dispose of bodies. One thing that the police thought was odd was that Fred and Donna were killed when Donna's brother Gary wasn't home. At the time of the murder, Gary happened to be at the home of Sonia Bitts, Shackleford's fiance. The police did not think that was a coincidence. They believed that Shackleford manipulated Sonia and her mother into luring Gary over to their home so that he could kill Donna and Fred. One of the three women Shackleford had manipulated, Bernadette Lestatter, said that Shackleford had asked her to kill Sonia. Although the police didn't have any physical evidence, they arrested Dale Shackleford on February 11, 2000. In one of his pockets, they found a suicide note supposedly written by Lestatter. The police theorized that Shackleford would get Lestatter to kill Sonia and then he would kill Lestatter to make it look like a suicide. This would tie off two loose ends. Dale Shackleford's trial started on October 16, 2000. The trial lasted 54 days. Shackleford's lawyer pointed out that there was no physical evidence that connected him to the murders. He said that Donna and Fred were killed in a murder-suicide or Sonia Bitts and her 17-year-old brother, Brian Abitz, committed the murders. The lawyer said that Shackleford had no reason to kill his ex-wife and her new boyfriend. He was confident he was going to beat the rape charges. Shackleford's three former girlfriends testified against him. Then the jury deliberated for two days. Shackleford was found guilty on two counts of first-degree murder, first-degree arson, preparing false evidence, conspiracy to commit murder, and conspiracy to commit arson. He was sentenced to death. Shackleford appealed his conviction and sentence. On June 1, 2011, he was ordered that he was to be resentenced. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that juries 
not judges, should impose death sentences. In September 2011, Shackelford was given two life sentences. Months after his father's murder in September 1999, Chuck Palahniuk's third novel, Invisible Monsters, was published. A month later, the movie Fight Club opened in theaters in North America. Eventually, the movie made just over $100 million on a $65 million budget. It fell below studio projections and it was considered a failure. But then the movie found life in the home video market and became a massive cult hit. Currently, it's number 12 on IMDb's Top 250 Movies. It also made Chuck Palahniuk a very popular writer. In 2001, he published his fourth novel, Choke, which was partly inspired by his father. Choke was made into a film in 2008. Clark Gregg directed it and it stars Sam Rockwell and Angelica Houston. After Choke, Chuck Palahniuk has gone on to publish 15 other novels, three non-fiction books, two graphic novels, both of which are sequels to Fight Club, and two adult coloring books. The last book he published was The Invention of Sound in 2020. There have been plans to make two of his novels, Lullaby and Rand, into films. But no progress has been made on either film in years. Chuck Palahniuk splits his time between his homes in Portland, Oregon and Vancouver, Washington. He lives with his partner, whom he met while he was working at Freightliner. The man who killed his father, Dale Shackelford, is serving a sentence at the Idaho Correctional Center in Boise, Idaho.